Dear friends and colleagues, welcome to the 8th Michael J. Marburger Symposium. It is an honor and pleasure to have you here with us this afternoon, uh, as we have uh, incredible, incredible experts from in and outside of Austria, international experts who have come here to celebrate for us the end of the year Congress we have. This is a traditional meeting where we share with our friends and colleagues who we have worked together all year long, our research expertise, our knowledge, our clinical care uh, advancements, and that is what today will be epitomized through this meeting today. It is my honor that Michael is here, who will give immediately a few words after I uh, and talk to you. And it's also an honor that uh, I will tell you over the two day, last two days, we had Bertrand Tombal, who is a tremendous clinician, clinical trialist, basic researcher, who are, was our uh, visiting professor, the eighth visiting Michael J. Marburger professor, who uh, I think has worked a marathon of lectures, cases, and presentations through. Uh, and uh, he's going to give also at the end of this meeting the, uh, our typical talk, what is the future of academic urology? Throughout the day, you're going to see incredible people. As people are trickling in uh, and coming from the clinical care, from the uh, hospital, um, you're going to have um, uh, views on stone, BPH, novel technology, and very heavy on oncology, which is the core of the business we do in our department. So I want to welcome you once again. I thank you for being here, and I hope you enjoy the meeting and have a good time, and feel, uh, feel free to ask questions. It should be as interactive and as fun as it gets. Michael, can I? Thank you, Shaug. Ladies and gentlemen, like always, it is a pleasure to be here again. And I have been in this building, I think, for the last 30 or 40 years, almost every year, several times. And I'm surprised and honored that this is the eighth Michael Marburger Symposium. I didn't realize eight, but I have to give you a short uh, note on what happened to me recently. I was invited by my grandchildren to a party. The family did, did it in a hotel, in the Rosewood Hotel, which is a very fancy hotel. And I didn't know what was going to happen. And they said, well, this is a party in honor, in honor of your 80th birthday. I said, 80th? Can't be. Uh, and they were wrong because they had missed it by two days. I was 82 days later. But nevertheless, it's sort of the wake-up call. We don't age, we mature. And meetings like this where you learn something new every minute and hear something new. There are many people here whom I've known for many years. And everyone develops new ideas and gets good ideas, and some of you worry if they're not so good. But ultimately, it is especially small meetings like this, small groups of highly motivated experts that certainly get you back up to get your own mind of state refreshed. And this is the process of this meeting, and therefore, thank you for coming. And now we will start right away. Uh, if I understand it correctly, we always have a lecture, and then we have some time for discussions, and please have questions, and we can even provocative questions. Everything is welcome, and we'll discuss it with the experts right away. Our first speaker is Bertrand Dupal. See, I haven't seen him. Ah, oh, there he comes. Who's, whom you all know, he has been a visiting professor and he is a real expert in many fields of urology. And he will discuss a very, I would say, controversial topic Testosterone replacement therapy in prostate cancer, 
patience, friend, or foe. Bertrand, please come up here. I don't know if you will be a friend, a foe, or whatever. Both. Both. Okay. We will discuss it in detail afterwards and just take over. Thank you so much. As you may guess, it's an honor being here when, uh, <clears throat> when uh, Sharok sent me an email saying that I should be invited to basically your meeting. I say, wow, that's a great opportunity. Then he told me that's about controversy. So I say, I'm not going to speak anymore about prostate cancer because after two, two days of lecture, there's no more controversy in prostate cancer, maybe a little bit around Casodex. We still have to discuss a little bit about that, but otherwise, all the rest has been solved, okay? So I chose another topic, which is a very controversial one, which is the, can we give testosterone to patients with prostate cancer, which is a very easy one. So these are my uh, conflict of interest. I've got money, but not necessarily for this topic. So we know actually that <coughs> it's a big taboo, I mean, it's probably every month that uh, we have patients that come to us because uh, their PSA is slightly elevated, they were on uh, testosterone supplementation therapy, and the G G GP say, you stop that immediately because you're gonna get prostate cancer. Uh, we have patients who had prostatectomy and who have uh, you know, CV hypogonadism and uh, where urologists say, if you, kill, if you take testosterone, you're gonna destroy all the work I did by removing your prostate. So I think that it's important to uh, go around the topic and say exactly where are we. So uh, basically there are five questions. First one, is there a link between the testosterone level and the risk of prostate cancer? Is uh, testosterone replacement therapy increasing the risk of prostate cancer in men with late onset hypogonadism? Is it a low in men that have been treated radically for prostate cancer? And then the next part, that's when people usually say that I'm totally crazy and irresponsible, is, is TRT a low in men with localized disease on active surveillance? And even better, would TRT be an option in men with advanced prostate cancer, which has been one of my topic of interest since I met my dear good friend Sam Denmate in Don Coffey's lab in 1996. So is there a link between the testosterone level and the risk of prostate cancer? Many observational study, difficult to draw, but basically there is nothing going in the right direction. So we can't say today that if your testosterone is elevated or if you take supplemental testosterone in the physiological range, there is no risk or significant risk of elevating your risk of prostate cancer. If you look at the trial, you will see that actually many of these trials actually seems even to indicate an inverted risk where your risk of cancer decreases with the value of testosterone. This comes from a very old so-called Morgenthaler theory that there is a saturation of the androgen receptor, which to be honest is not absolutely correct because the saturation curve is in normal cancer cells. It is not sure that in some prostate cancer cells actually uh, the relationship between the testosterone and the promotion of uh, the AR may be slightly different, but overall epidemiological study don't show a major increased risk of uh, prostate cancer with the level of uh, androgens and in general. Uh, there are a few interesting papers like this one uh, showing a, a relationship between a low free testosterone and a prostate cancer risk, but there are very, very few papers like this. and. Uh, there are even more interesting data. This one is coming from uh, MD Anderson, where it seems, and that's something that has been actually uh, in the air for many years, that actually having a low testosterone would be associated with a higher risk of Gleason score. There are many, expl many explanations beyond that. Is it a screening problem? Is it a true biological effect? Nobody has the answer, but once again, to the first question, is there a link between the testosterone level and the risk of prostate cancer? It is unclear. We can't say that. And there is even weak indication that it would be the opposite, that actually having a low testosterone would lead to a higher rate of high-risk cancer. But once again, very little. So 
Second question, if you are hypogonadal and you clearly are symptomatic, I'm not speaking about people who take testosterone because they read it in a book. I'm speaking about testosterone supplementation in men with proven clinically relevant hypogonadism, which do exist. Uh, is it increase the risk of prostate cancer? Uh, once again, uh, clearly not. First of all, uh, if you increase the level of, so if you take testosterone, what you should look in the serum and in the prostate is DHT, okay? So do you increase the level of DHT in prostate cancer patient if you supplement them with uh, testosterone, ex external testosterone? I, I would invite you to look at this. You see placebo six months, there is no very significant increase of DHT in the prostate of these patients. So uh, the effect is more systemic, as you may see here, than intracellular. Uh, this is another randomized control trial looking at different aspects like uh, prostate volume, prostate specific antigen, IPSS, Euroflow matry, and once again, if you compare the testosterone to the placebo, there is not really a significant difference for any of these, except for uh, a slight increase in PSA level. And if you look at the risk of aggressive prostate cancer, once again, you've got uh, the same. There is no indication that in this patient there is a significant increase in the risk of aggressive prostate cancer. So in the group of men with low testosterone and a normal PSA to start with, testosterone treatment was not associated with an increased risk of aggressive of any uh, prostate cancer. This is, uh, sorry, this is another study, similar cohort st uh, study, large uh, observational cohort study, same uh, conclusion, long-term exposure to testosterone replacement therapy was associated with reduced risk of mortality, essentially cardiovascular event and prostate cancer. Why? Because keep in mind who was the first specialist to say, be careful of having a low testosterone. This is not the urologist. This is the cardiovascular surgeon who actually said 10 years ago already that having a low testosterone is a risk factor for cardiovascular disease. There is a caveat to that, is that in the study that use injectable, so injection with an acute rise in testosterone, there has been a increased risk of mortality by cardiovascular disease on short-term duration therapy. And people believe now that it's a similar effect to what we have with LHRH agonist. You have a rise in testosterone, and in patients with predisposition, which most of them are unknown, it results into a um, increased risk of cardiovascular disease. So there is a caveat. This is a UK clinical practice research data linked on 13,000 men. Once again, same observation, no different in terms of uh, the crude risk between the use of testosterone replacement therapy and the risk of prostate cancer, no difference between those receiving uh, TRT and those not receiving TRT. So once again, overall, the use of TRT was not associated with an increased risk of prostate cancer in men with late onset hypogonadism. Once again, it's important, okay? So uh, based on this, can we give testosterone to men with prostate cancer? Because so far, we have not spoken about men with prostate cancer. We have only been spoken about the risk of prostate cancer if you have a high testosterone or if you take testosterone. So let's go one further step. You do a prostatectomy to a patient. He's 57 years old. He's very good. He sees you like one and a half years after. He say, you know, it's strange. I have no libido. My mood is going down. I've got like some weakness. I'm depressed. You measure testosterone one, two, three times. You measure SHBG, and clearly the guy has a low, has a late onset hypogonadism. Is it a crime to tell that patient, I'm going to give you testosterone supplementation? Do you have to wait five years, 10 years, 15 years? I think the answer is no. Uh, there are no many survey, many studies will look at that. Once again, there is no randomized control trial, but it seems to be the thing in urology anyway for every disease we treated. 
And overall, we can say that it's roughly very safe. This is a very nice uh, study published in 2016. 82 hypogonadal men with, uh, treated with testosterone therapy, 50 men with radiation therapy, 22 with radical prostatectomy, and eight on active surveillance. And basically, if you look at the outcome, you don't see uh, any severe impact, not on the PSA, nor the risk of progression. This is an other safety survey on uh, testosterone replacement therapy in prostate cancer survival. Uh, published in 2019. It's a total of 1,000 patients treated with definitive uh, local therapy for non-metastatic castration resistant, uh, mostly radiotherapy surgery, and once again, uh, you don't see a big effect in the favor of uh, biochemical recurrence, PSA recurrence, and other. So clearly, uh, you will tell me that the confidence interval is super broad because like any of these meta-analysis, it's a sum of uh, many small trials. But if you look actually at, where is the, if you look at the analysis and the heterogeneity, once again, we can conclude that, that is roughly safe. So in this systemic therapy review and meta-analysis, we did not observe higher rate of biochemical recurrence after TRT for non-metastatic prostate cancer patient after definitive local therapy. And there is even one a provocative trial published in 2020 that actually showed the opposite, where TRT actually reduced the risk of biochemical recurrence after radical prostatectomy. Uh, everybody look at this strangely, but no, we have to put that in perspective. The study I'm going to show you of both bipolar androgen therapy. So uh, it makes sense to some extent. So. What about the patient on active surveillance? Because active surveillance, by definition, is you have prostate cancer, it's non-aggressive, and the doctor has decided that for the sake of your sexual health, you should not get treated. And we're going to follow you. We know that there is, for a lot of reasons, there is a lot of coexisting hypogonadism and uh, low gleason grade cancer. That's another topic, but that's something now. And we know also that in this patient, they have deterioration of their quality of life. So the demand, once again, is very high. I see patients like this, where the urologists say, okay, you need testosterone, then you're gonna have to have a radical prostatectomy, and then it's gonna be safe to give you testosterone replacement therapy, which I think uh, I wouldn't do that, okay? So uh, do we have a lot of data? No, we don't have a lot of data. We have three very small trials on active surveillance, 47 patients. I would treat that as a phase one evidence that there is no significant increase in the risk of progression. Uh, there has been four trial here, retrospective survey. They basically all show that we can't say today that there is a significant risk of progression. We have to be careful here. So meaning that to me, this has to be treated as phase two evidence and a study must be done. This study has been started and since now two years, every patient which is on active surveillance is screened for late onset hypogonadism using biological parameter and the ADAMS questionnaire. And those that are defined as being late onset symptomatic hypogonadism are actually randomized in a study comparing testosterone replacement therapy plus dutasteride. Why dutasteride? To block the transformation of the testosterone into DHT in the prostate and because there is the redeemed data indicating that you may have. So are we ready to prime time to treat all the patient on active surveillance with testosterone replacement therapy? I would say I believe yes, but my belief result in a clinical trial not yet in broad practice changing. But there are data on this. This is the CACA trial, and once again, you don't see major change in PSA, no major difference in uh, progression if they were on testosterone replacement therapy. So what EAU guideline says, uh, actually they don't speak really about the indication. They, however, say something important is that if you treat these men, 
we would actually recommend transdermal testosterone replacement therapy because the problem of the injection, and they are long-lasting, you may expose your patient to an increased risk of cardiovascular disease if at risk, and you may actually uh, not be able to do anything if it goes wrong. So for patients with prostate cancer, whether it's post-radical treatment or inactive surveillance, please use transderm transdermal T. There are plenty of new form with uh, poor opening technologies who increase the resorption of these drugs, so it's very easy to use. Finally, can you give testosterone in a man with metastatic cancer? That would be crazy, actually. You would say nobody can do that. At least there is a guy on the planet who did that. His name is Sam Denmead. He's a medical oncologist in Johns Hopkins University. And together with his friend uh, Anton Arakis, they started very, very provocative trial using androgen, androgen uh, replacement therapy at very high dose in men with advanced prostate cancer. We call that uh, bipolar androgen deprivation therapy. Don't do that at home. This is food for discussion. It's very provocative. We have trial going on, but I think that it's super interesting. The first one is actually called Batman. Actually, this is the idea of doing intermittent androgen deprivation therapy but when you stop the agonist actually giving high-dose testosterone. What Sam did uh, when we were together is a lot of study in prostate cancer cells showing that actually, especially in castration resistant, high-dose testosterone would work as an antagonist on the androgen receptor and actually induce apoptosis instead of progressing. So he did that very, very provocative trial, which is called Batman, where you see men are on ADT, after six months, if they respond well, he reintroduces high-dose testosterone in these patients, and he's doing actually cycling of not what I call passive intermittent androgen deprivation therapy, where you stop the treatment and you wait that testosterone goes high, but giving high-dose testosterone to these patients. Uh, and he look at one year. And at one year, most patients still have a low PSA. So given the testosterone in between the cycle didn't have an oncological impact on the, the cancer in that phase two trial. And very interestingly, you see rapid change in the quality of life. Look at the uh, sexual activity, look at the fact P. When you reintroduce the testosterone, you are basically correcting their, um, their quality of life. So I think that at the time, where we are redesigning and giving more and more intermittent androgen deprivation therapy. This Batman study, which is now led to a phase three, will be very important. And finally, the one once, the transformer. I really, it has the impact to transform our view on metastatic castration resistant. Because everywhere on the planet, metastatic castration resistant is somebody you keep on hormone therapy and you adding something. Was Sam did, actually, is take patient progressing on abirateron and randomizing one group to enzalutamide, so basically keeping androgen suppression, and the other group giving high-dose testosterone. So everybody say, you are crazy, you're going to kill patient. Actually, look at the PSA response rate. You're going to tell me enzalutamide is not very good when the patient progress on abirateron, but in terms of PSA response, testosterone supplementation was equivalent. And if you look at the crossover, the patient could even further respond to testosterone suppletion when he had enzalutamide and vice versa. So at a time where we have these patients progressing on hormone therapy, before we will throw in much more active and expensive drug, I think there is the place to design, and they are ongoing, to reintroduce testosterone to this patient because one of the immediate benefit is a dramatic improvement in their quality of life. These guys, they will die anyway. So restoring a good quality of life for six or seven months is perceived by many of these patients. And when you look at PFS, there was no difference between enzalutamide and testosterone at crossover. So I think that really, in the advanced setting, the contention that these guys should remain castrated for the rest of their life as known being severely challenged. There are phase three going on. 
They have many trials going on. And I think that that concept of bipolar androgen suppression is one of the more provocative, where everybody do always the same to all the patients. I think he has to be congratulated to really trying to come with a new concept. So I think that what is the immediate, uh, what is the immediate consequence of that is that no, we are thinking about giving this new drug without suppressing testosterone. We've done phase two with enzalutamide monotherapy. It's worked very well. The testosterone increased, the quality of life improved, the PSA goes down, and we're gonna get the MFS result with the result of the EMBARC trial. We will submit at, uh, we will submit at ASCO the result of a similar trial with darolutamide. So I think that I said once that my goal of my life is to remove ADT and androgen deprivation therapy from the global picture of patients with prostate cancer because it's affecting them every day. And I'm very pleased that we, we do little step and I'm sure that in 15 years from now, we're gonna be there. Anyway, at this point in time, I think that nobody should say that it is forbidden to give testosterone to a patient with prostate cancer and nobody should say that giving testosterone will increase your prostate cancer risk. This is not, absolutely not, based on robust evidence. I think that already an important paradigm shift has occurred within the field in which testosterone therapy may not be regarded as a viable option for selected men with prostate cancer suffering from testosterone deficiency. Thank you very much for your attention. overview questions. I have one comment. It's really a comment, not a question. I mean, there is one thing at least we older urologists always consider as the wrong approach is treating a patient who comes with sexual dysfunction after curative treatment for prostate cancer by giving him testosterone. There are trials that have shown that there clearly is a correlation. The problem we have to, when we look at these trials, is they're very complex trials. You look at the risk factors from the cancer and the type of treatment they received. Testosterone may be low, but it's not necessarily the factor. I think one thing we have to, at least we older urologists have to realize that the main reason for sexual dysfunction in these patients with prostate cancer is erectile dysfunction. And the erectile dysfunction can be treated very successfully today. We have had excellent responses for example, with Botox injections, which the patient does himself, and which takes away the, the psychological figure that he can't do anything, he can take care of it. And that's one approach. The other approach is if something goes wrong in a patient who's got prostate cancer and he's being treated with testosterone for one reason or the other, everyone will say, well, the reason why the cancer went wrong was the testosterone. You've showed the huge data source we have for this. And I would just like to supplement that Mulhall from the Sloan Kettering in New York presented 4,000 cases in a prospective trial last week at the meeting in Malmö. He said, we can't really correlate if the patient had testosterone or no testosterone. The main factors are always the risk factors, how he was treated, and so on. And I think we have to be aware of the fact that there is sexual dysfunction, <coughs> even for us good surgeons. We have to accept that, but we can treat it. We can treat it very effectively. And we have to talk about and talk with the patients and put them to treatment. But the role of testosterone is not clearly clear yet. And if you give a patient testosterone, no matter in what form, 
result is a potential that if the prostate cancer goes wrong, this was one of the causes. So I think we just have to be very careful. And this model study, 4,000 patients submitted to radical prostatectomy, followed up very carefully. He couldn't even say patients that have a higher testosterone preoperatively to those that have a low testosterone are at a higher risk. He couldn't say that. No, but that's why one important thing is that uh, if you look at the, the, like the other questionnaire, having erectile dysfunction is not, I mean, it's erectile dysfunction after surgery is probably the worst indicator of a low testosterone. Because they have many causes. So that's why I do insist. I'm speaking about patients who've been clearly defined as hypogonadal, not those who have erectile dysfunction, because uh, the only indication, if they are hypogonadal, it increases the efficiency of drugs like uh, PDL, PDE5 inhibitors, so that we could claim, but isolated erectile dysfunction after radical prostatectomy, don't blame the testosterone, blame the surgeon, okay? <clears throat> Thank you so much for that really insightful and thought-provoking presentation in the spirit of being somewhat provocative, as Professor Marburger and Sherlock said. Would you agree that testosterone is a primary fuel for prostate cancer growth? Yeah, that, I would say no, because that's, I mean, there, it's very interesting that if you look back at the history, it will be by family. And I would put myself in the family of Don Coffey, John Isaacs, Bill Isaacs. What we know is that the day the prostate cancer change, testosterone is implicated in the progression, but not, and, and, and probably the whole hypothesis of the saturation curve of Morgenthaler is probably not as true as he would say, but that would say that in a normal man, and that's what basically Sam shows, it should not concede, there are many fuel, this is probably one of fuel, but that fuel is no more than others. So I would say, I would tend to say no. But that's, doing so, I'm extremely opinionated. Would you agree that the primary treatment for a man with advanced prostate cancer on initial diagnosis is testosterone suppression in some way? It's, yeah, it's, it's AR blockade that we do since... Since Charles, again, we, we do AR blockade through androgen suppression. That, that's the limitation to that model, where what we do when we reduce androgen, and, and, and a good example of this is that, for, in, for instance, you increase FSH, you increase LH, you increase production by the... the so to me, the, the reference treatment of advanced prostate cancer is AR blockade. And we do AR blockade by doing androgen deprivation therapy. You know, if you look like, take for instance estrogens. Estrogens are very effective. And if estrogen have been abandoned because they were toxic, but uh, there's the patch study you now in UK. So I think that we've gone to the poorest form of AR targeted treatment we could dream about. So that's why, and, and that's, Testosterone alone in some patient with advanced prostate cancer may actually work as an antagonist, and that's why you've got this study. But I would say that we have done androgen deprivation therapy as a sole systemic treatment, but that was a surrogate to AR blockade. And my personal conviction, but it's more in the level of Don Quixote than, uh, than the guidelines, is that we should address that issue and correct it in the next 10 years. I think your approach of doing this in a systematic trial, trial way is exactly what needs to be done, and certainly we'll be able to find some really interesting but answers. May I just, for the sake, because we are running a bit short in time, there, if you look at the hard data, there's a lot of hard data around, but we can't really secure it. And if we start saying, well, it's a result of our surgery, we're killing our own source. I think what we have to do is we have to look at side effects, at sexual dysfunction, and treat erectile dysfunction, and the problem is solved without the potential risks which 
otherwise may come from androgen ablation. So I think we don't know yet, but there is a problem, and we can't simply because the patient says, I've got erectile dysfunction, I'm unhappy about it, I need some testosterone. It's not that easy. We don't know. And that was perfectly... Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you so much. This is... Uh, did it for the time. Thank you. So Bertrand has been an incredible two days talking about prostate cancer up and down and really has changed many things we, have, we think and we do. Uh, thank you very much, Bertrand. We're going to have another lecture from you. The next speaker is going to be Kemal Saritza, who is a professor in Istanbul at the Biruni University, who is a, a world-renowned expert in endourology. He does everything, Kemal. but uh, he's going to be an expert. You have to take this one. Uh, he's an expert in, in endourology and stone management, urolithiasis, and he's going to talk about the management of stones, what is the future. You know, this meeting is based on what is the frontier. So we ask every speaker to talk about something, what is the future, and not what is the past. We're not interested about guidelines. We're interested where are the frontiers, where we can go, and where we will go. Thank you so much, Kemal, for coming and being such a wonderful person. Thank you, Sharok. Thanks a lot, dear colleagues, dear friends. First of all, it's a great privilege and honor for me to be here today and being invited to talk about the future of or new game changers in the management of stones. Again, it's a privilege to talk in front of first a milestone in urology, Dr. Marbarger, pleasure, and also distinguished participants here. Over the next 15 minutes, I will try to talk about the new game changers that they let us to apply the procedures in a very practical manner to increase the stone free rates and limit the complications. The incidence of stone disease is going up, you know it very well, and recurrent C disease is a headache for all urologists dealing with this issue, significant impact of this modal disease on the quality of life and social economic factors is another fact for us. These are the management tools that we use today and Beginning with ureteroscopic stone management, we know that treatment alternatives in terms of invasiveness begin with open surgery in the past, and over the years back, we begin to apply PNL as an invasive procedure, later on shock meditatives in the 80s, and now we have ureteroscopy, particularly flexible ureteroscopy. Regarding the flexible ureteroscopy, these are the indications in EAU guidelines, and of all them, stone size was a indication, but important indication, and in the beginning we thought that stones sizing less than two centimeters are the good stones to treat with this modality. But increasing experience in this field, clinical introduction of holmium yak laser, and also, again, depending on the availability of all these uh, factors, let us to apply this procedure for stones, larger stones, and multiple stones. Now we tend to treat larger stones, as you see here, larger than 25 uh, millimeter. And going through the literature, we may see that stones larger than three centimeters are being treated. And this nice meta-analysis shows us that we may treat with uh, high stone-free rates and complication rates will be really comparable. And overall complication rates, as you see here, are around 10 percent. and. A subgroup analysis did show that for stones sizing between two to three centimeters, around 96 percent stone free rates could be anticipated in experience sense. However, treating large stones did bring us some problems during our clinical practice. We are using uh, reusable scopes, and the durability and cost issues began really important factors. If we treat large stones, multiple stones, stones in lower calyx and harder stones, we, that will like long-lasting procedures and forced procedures. And during these procedures, we may damage our scope, and this is a huge cost issue, not only for the department, also for the hospital. And based on these facts, now we have single-use scopes in the market and introduced to our clinical practice, even single use scopes with a 7.5 in the tip. Highly, let's say, delicate stones to be uh, used to treat stones in our clinical practice. Image quality is excellent, comparable, and 
as you see here, when you compare them in terms of not only effectivity, but the quality of image with the reusable one, excellent to use them. A systematic review here, we see 11 studies around 400, 470 patients. So complication rates are comparable and also no significant differences regarding procedural duration, stone size, stone clearance, and complication rates could be seen between reusable scopes and uh, single-use scopes. In the end, now, we are using them, and the potential indications for single-use scopes could be stones in the unfavorable locations, in the lower pole particularly, procedures with expected difficulties, large stones, long-lasting operations, surgeons with low experience, and also limited number of cases, backup for reusable scopes, particularly in training centers, and severely infected cases. A new game changer for ureteroscope may be the suctioning during the procedure. We know that using a flexible scope in the collecting system for a long period of time will raise the pressure inside the kidney. And this is a risk factor for the post-operative uh, infections. And balancing the internal uh, pelvic pressure is utmost importance during the procedure, particularly for the long-lasting difficult procedures. And keeping this fact in, uh, this fact in mind, Yet now we have suctioning modality during ureteroscopy. Suctioning by using ureteric excess sheets, ureteroscope channel, and special suction device. As you see here, suction parameter has been incorporated to the ureteroscopes. And in the market first, a clear PETRA, this is the first suctioning system, attached to the disposable uh, ureteral excess sheet in order to suction the flu from the collecting system and have the pressure inside very low and effective. Published data, although limited, it do show us that it is safe and effective and improved stone-free rates immediately after the procedures could be anticipated. Visualization and image quality becomes really better and better. In this study also, infection complications and shorter operative time it have been uh, uh, observed. In addition to the suctioning, we have uh, really uh, new systems to balance uh, bal uh, pressure inside to uh, monitor it. And here you see internal pressure control. Automatically, it can be monitored, and intra pelvic pressure could be kept in lower levels during the procedure by monitoring it during suctioning during the procedure itself. That will let us to have rare complications and with really balanced uh, pressure inside the kidney, less and less infective complications and larger stones could be treated in this way. Here you see uh, moderated and monitored pressures is uh, available and to control them during the procedure by using different systems. We may do the suction through the ureteroscope itself, also by using ureteric XX sheet. These are two modalities, depending on the system. You may use it to remove the greater proportion of the uh, stone particles just after the procedure, and 100% stone free rates could be anticipated. Another game changer for flexible ureteroscopy could be the use of new uh, laser systems. I know my dear friend Dr. Enki will long to talk about it, and I will with a couple of slides and past issue. Here you see, we were using Holmibiak laser with great efficacy and success rates in the past, and also we are continuing to use it, but now we have Tulium fiber laser to use in a, let's say, higher effectivity and higher uh, stone-free rates. Moses technology was the first, let's say, parameter to be used, two pulses one after the other, in order to increase the effectivity of uh, shock pulses and studies Although, again, limited, it show us that use of Moses technology will let us to have in, uh, increased uh, disintegration of the stones, increased stone-free rates, and less complication rates. Tulium fiber laser, in terms of laser settings, my dear friend will talk about it. In the pulse energy, frequency, pulse duration could be adjusted up to the wide range of parameters by, by you, by yourself, and also if we compare the other parameters, as you see here, speed, 
dust size after the procedure or during the procedure, retropulsion rates, and also size of fiber is highly thin. And uh, again, here you see the parameters, properties, and when you compare tulum fiber with halmium laser, you will have a wide range of applications or moderations, and my dear friend will talk about it. System is compact, and uh, studies published are highly limited, outcomes are limited, but we may say that when we uh, compare tulum fiber laser with holmium, it's really higher, have a higher efficacy. Dust rates are really um, effective than high holmium laser, and also the operational duration will come down. In this study, as we see, for also ureteric stones, the outcomes are better, operational duration is uh, shorter, and the efficacy and complications will be limited. Pediatric stones could be treated with tulum. This is the only publication in the literature, but uh, it shows that we may apply this uh, uh, type of laser, I mean, in pediatric cases also with uh, high efficacy and no complications. Advantages, performing at a higher disintegration speed, wider and more comprehensive parameter combinations, reduced stone retropulsion risk, maintenance of optimal visibility, no thermal radiation damage, and also ease of use and versatility is the advantages of tulum fiber. Another game changer may be for the application of flexible radioscopy, the use of robots in stones. We know it is effective in uh, oncology now and established, but for stones also could be a game changer. The first robot came from Turkey, from Elmet, and this, is a, this will be an advantage for the ergonomy of the surgeons during the procedure, particularly for larger stones, for multiple stones, standing on the same position, holding the scope in your hands and uh, keeping your, uh, getting your attention when it's a fixed position, it will be a problem for ergonomy. And study showed that if you use the robot system, sit in a comfortable position and adjust all the parameters in front of you, patient is away from you, you are in a comfortable position, you have enough space, and you may adjust all the parameters on the screen. I mean, laser, irrigation rate, uh, what, where is the tip of the uh, flexible scope? You can do them in a very comfortable position and in a precise manner. Uh, in addition to this robotic system, uh, now we have another second one, ILI robotic system, a little bit maybe practical by using a joystick, and third one will come from South Korea. And that shows us that robotic applications will have a meaning, meaningful impact for in, in, in clinical practice. Coming to the PNL, what are the new game changers? Reduction of the track size is a fact, and we are using the smaller and smaller tracks in the last 10 years. We know that tear in the kidney during the uh, peritoneal excess begin with 15 French. You should be very careful, and when you compare a standard PNL with 11 French, uh, ultra mini PNL, yes, the trauma will be less and less. And over the years back, we see that miniaturization with mini PNL, ultra mini PNL, super mini PNL, and micro PNL are the uh, choices that they use. But miniaturization also did bring some problems uh, together with this application. We know that uh, tract is smaller, and we have the fragments inside. Pressure in the kidney, we may go up, and bringing all these fragments out through a small channel will be a real as a challenge for the endurologist. So we, we, we incorporated some other game changers in order to irrigate the system and suction the system in order to bring all these uh, fragments out in a practical manner. This is the tip of ultra mini uh, nephroscope, and you may flush the system and bring the fragments out uh, vacuum uh, by using this effect, but actually this concept did come from China from Professor Zeng. He introduced super mini PNL and active irrigation, active suctioning begin with him in order to bring all the dust just during the procedure by suctioning them. Miniaturization did bring us all these advantages with it, and we know them very well, but the pressure inside the kidney during the mini PNL, super PNL, may go up. And possible increase of internal pressure may bring some complications, not only during the procedure, as you see, extravasation, and also after the procedure, infective complication may come with the pressure. So we need to bring the flu out to balance the pressure inside the kidney. 
and suctioning is also a new game changer and component for during the PNL procedures here, as you see here, we now access sheets that allow us to suction the fluid and also the fragments during the procedure. Here you see you may get the fluid out and also fragments will be suctioned and you will have in the box in the end of the procedure dust and fragments together. With EMS also, uh, you may use this uh, suctioning system just to get all the fragments out during the procedure. Over the years back, we used, sorry for that, uh, the Whirlpool vir effect. Ah, okay. So, suctioning during the minimal invasive PNL, during the complex and large stones, will give us enormous advantages. As you see here, complications will come down. The pro uh, all the fragments will come out during the procedure, and in the end of the procedure, sometimes you will see that the patient is completely stone free. When you compare suctioning PNL with the normal mini PNL without suctioning, here the others were able to show that the procedural duration will come down, stone free rates will go really up, and overall the complications will really be limited. We may monitor and balance the procedure. Uh, pressure during the procedure, and now we have some systems that we use them during the procedure in order to monitor what is the pressure inside the kidney and what should we do during the procedure. Regarding the new access techniques uh, during PNL, there is only one method now that uh, is promising. It is the electromagnetic uh, tracking system, and it, there is a tip sensor tip in the in, uh, in the. Uh, flexible ureteroscope, you may go up in the kidney and electromagnetic navigation with man, mag, magnetic marker placed inside the kidney and on the needle, a software making the navigation guidance for you for the needle in conjunction with a marker inside the kidney, you will bring the two points together and you will be in in a practical manner. It is promising, limited publication outcomes, but it, shows, it, it seems that it will be really a new game changer in the uh, future for us to get in the collecting system in a very practical and shorter time. So today, I know the oncologists, they have PSA, but we have also PSA in stones, personalized stone approach. We will use all these game changers. We will identify the best treatment for the patients in an individual-based manner and decide what to do, how to cover this, to increase the stone-free rates and bring the complication rates to a certain extent. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Kemal. Questions? Mehmet has a question. Good Please. afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to have you here. Kemal, very nice to see you. Pleasure. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Wonderful, wonderful presentation. I have a question for you. As an expert in the field, you, what is your opinion on the future? Because your topic is the future of stone surgery. Um, where do you see percutaneous nephrolithotomy in the future? Will the flexible arthroscopy with superpositolium laser take over larger stones? Will PCNL be obsolete? And you haven't mentioned it, but you know it very well, the burst wave lithotripsy from uh, Adam Maxwell and his group in uh, Seattle in Washington University. It's coming now in one or two years uh, to the market. So it will also be a game changer probably. Where do you see the future of PCNL? Me, as someone who does PCNLs with his heart, I'm really sorry to say that I don't think PCNL has a large future, but I'd like to have your opinion. Thank you so much. Very nice question. So the problem is to be less and less invasive. Open surgery, forgotten now. Nobody performs this procedure. PNL is a very important alternative to treat the cases, but we know that puncturing the kidney is a type three injury to the kidney. We know it very well. So PNL will go further. We will use it, but when we think about the tulium fiber laser, its efficacy, and also flexible rotoscope, very smaller ones, and uh, letting us to be inside the kidney in a very quick manner to treat the kidneys, I think that stones up to three centimeters, at least now I can say that, will be treated with flexible rotoscopy in a very successful manner with lower complication rates, and that means use of PNL for stones sizing less than three centimeters in the near future will come less and less, and multiple punctures, particularly with PNL, with mini PNL systems, may be applicable in the future for uh, multiple stones 
large and complex stones, but I am sure flexible rotoscopy with tulium laser will bring the incidence of PNL applications down and down. Okay. If I may, I have a follow-up question, Cheryl. When we are pushing the frontiers of stone treatment, where do you see the role of artificial intelligence in all of this? In the surgery, when, do you see an artificial intelligence combined with the robot that you show doing the operation and analyzing the stone, the tissue, and doing it all by himself, maybe in 10 years, 20 years? Of course, why not? Particularly for PNL, to, uh, finding the best place to puncture the kidney, automatic systems. Now, I know many uh, companies and friends working on that, a very practical puncture of the kidney by using this artificial uh, intelligence system and also for the other part of the stone management, it will be a new and real game changer to bring the procedures in a highly practical manner, shorter and let's say a highly effective manner. Thank you. Thank you very much for this very good yeah, overview on the, yeah, we need a good picture. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, that was an excellent overview. I would just like to add one perhaps personal thought about all of this. As you know, I've been involved in stone treatment very heavily for the years. And I remember when I retired from your job, we were doing 2,000 stone cases every year. And one problem I was continuously facing, having a big institution, where number one, the need for expertise of the individual. The urologist had to be well trained. He had to know how to use the flexible scope, how to use the laser, when not to use it, and what to avoid. And the other problem which we were continuously flooded with, we probably solved it in the meantime, was the cost of all of this. I mean, when you need 20 to 30 flexible ureteroscopes a month, <laughs> you hit every budget after a while. So there's, and I, again, last week in Malmö, heard a very interesting review of the side effects of modern stone treatment in Germany, not based on clinical data, but based on data from the public health insurances. And they look at ureteroscopy, flexible ureteroscopy, percutaneous open stone surgery, and shockwave lithotripsy. And ureteroscopy was highest in the rate of secondary complications, in the need for new emergency procedures, and in complications. So that, oh, and, and in inefficiency, highest was shockwave lithotripsy. So that, this is an exciting part of our work and we need it. But it is very difficult to say at this time, do this or do that. It has to be individualized according to the patient and to the expertise of the surgeon. Exactly. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Wonderful words. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have, uh, Kemal has been a great supporter of our department and partnership with Christian. And now with Dr. Kikic, in, within the next year, we will uh, start at the University of Vienna, Medical University of Vienna, a stone center that will be focusing on research, academia, but also clinical care, innovation in stone management, urolithiasis. The next speaker I want to introduce is Professor Haji Brahimi from the University of Tabriz. Uh, she's a full professor of urology, functional urology, and urodynamics. She's also a head of the fellowship and the residency program, and she's also the director of the research center at this university, which is the second biggest university in Iran. And it's a tremendous pleasure and honor to have her with us. Thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear colleagues, it's a great honor for me to uh, be here with you. And uh, uh, thanks to Professor Shariat and his great team for the invitation. Today I would like to, uh, to uh, talk about uh, the update in diagnosis and management of uh, post-prostatectomy incontinence. Um, 
Actually, uh, my name is uh, Sakina Hajabrahimi. I'm full uh, professor of urology and functional urology and reconstructive surgery in Tabriz University of Medical Science in the northwest of Iran. And that's why, uh, actually, um, university and uh, the hospital uh, that I'm working there. And we will talk more about our university and uh, our hospital because we will have a celebration and someone to congratulate after my talk. So uh, the objectives uh, of my uh, talk is uh, about the epidemiology of uh, uh, PPI and the etiology and prognostic factors. It's very important uh, for uh, PPI. And then I will uh, to talk about uh, the uh, evaluation and management of mild to severe uh, PPI uh, uh, and um, complications. So about the epidemiology, uh, actually, the uh, male stress urinary incontinence uh, is, uh, has uh, uh, predominantly uh, iatrogenic after po uh, radical prostatectomy, but it's possible even after uh, the uh, uh, just simple prostatectomy and even after uh, TUR. And it's defined as involuntary uh, leakage of uh, urine uh, during any effort, extraction, or sneeze and coughing. So the, uh, regarding the epidemiology of PPI, I can tell you the, the prevalence in different literature is between 22.5 uh, to 90%. The reason for this wide difference is the different definition of incontinence, and there is no standard definition in many of the publications. And uh, on the other hand, there is no significant difference between the rate of incontinence in open prostatectomy or in uh, robotic assisted radical prostatectomy. In addition, uh, I have to tell you, in the case with robotic uh, uh, um, assisted uh, prostatectomy, the rate of improvement of continence is much more better than open or laparoscopic one. But we don't know what is the reason exactly. So regarding OAB or overactive bladder, uh, uh, I mean urgency, frequency, with or without urinary incontinence, I have to say that there is very common, but we have no uh, uh, evidences regarding the incidence or prevalence of OAB after uh, uh, radical prostatectomy. However, uh, uh, so far, there is a lack of uh, robust data for its incidence, and sometimes we underestimate uh, the diagnosis of OAB in patients uh, with post prostatectomy incontinence. So, how about the impact? Actually, uh, the PPI has highly impact uh, on uh, patients' quality of life. During my last 20 years uh, experience in functional urology, unfortunately, I have not seen any patient in my office uh, when, uh, because any tearing when, when uh, he is describing his problem. And sometimes uh, uh, the patients told me, uh, told me, doctor, please kill me or treat me. <laughs> So there is no option between killing or treatment, and it shows that what is the big impact of this problem for uh, for those patients. In addition, the border, the cost burden of this uh, uh, problem is so high. Uh, for example, in UK, uh, US, uh, it's. Uh, uh, between $90 to $32 billion per year. So regarding pathophysiology, maybe it's good for our young colleagues because it's important and the prevention always is most important than treatment. The changes in occur in the anatomy and preoperative bladder function, operative techniques and experience of the surgeons, pelvic innervation and damage of normal vascular bundles and 
development of post prostatectomy fibrosis uh, in the anatomic uh, places can make uh, some uh, problem postoperatively for the patient. Uh, so the good anastomosis in anterior and posterior site of the, uh, the urethra to the bladder neck is very important uh, for, for uh, prevention of uh, the uh, incontinence. Regarding function, actually the, most of these patients have some uh, how, uh, functional problem because of their age, because of uh, any uh, neurogenic background or any other uh, uh, usual pro problem regarding prostate okay, and any other, uh, um, uh, other underlying disorders. So uh, you can see, uh, 40 to 100 person functional problem in many of those cases. But the point is, the most of the time we have mixture of the functional problem. For example, overactive death resort and overactive uh, uh, and stress incontinence uh, or BOO and overactive bladder or at the same time DO and DU. So it's very difficult to understand which one is the pro is predominant problem. So we have to focus on function and we have to listen our patient's story. So there is some uh, predictors uh, for urinary incontinence after radical prostatectomy. And there is some systems uh, for predictions as well. And EAU uh, uh, recommended these two uh, systems for prediction of urinary incontinence. It's based on, on the demographic factors and uh, uh, two uh, famous questionnaire of uh, ICI uh, regarding incontinence and incontinence and quality of life. So if you want to go to evaluation of these patient, it's uh, very clear that we, should, we must have a very uh, good uh, history taking and we have to listen our patient's history completely. And then uh, we need a good physical exam and uh, ultrasound for residual urine and uh, urine analysis. And uh, in addition, we have to fill a questionnaire, a short questionnaire for stress urinary incontinence. ICIQSF uh, is the best one for uh, this situation. And maybe or may not, we, have, we need to have a PAT test as well to evaluate the prognosis and improvement of the, uh, those patients. So after uh, this uh, um, uh, evaluation, we can understand if our patient have a stress incontinence, mixed incontinence, or uh, only or active uh, bladder or urgency incontinence. So if the patient has any urgency incontinence, it's easy to do, as, as same as other patients with the, uh, uh, urge incontinence, and we have to start from medication and then go to the Botox injection or any other intervention like uh, other uh, patients. But if we have a stress urinary incontinence, we, uh, we will go to the first line uh, for the, uh, first line intervention, like, like lifestyle uh, uh, modification, uh, pelvic floor muscle training, and bladder trainings. And if we have any failure in this phase, we need some specialized uh, management to find if there is any sphincteric uh, insufficiency, and then we have to uh, solve the sphincteric insufficiency. For the mixed incontinence, it's the most difficult part. We have to know which the problem is predominant, the urge part or a stress part, and then we, have, uh, we must have a good share decision making for our patients regarding the outcome of any intervention that we want to do. So in summary, uh, most of uh, these uh, uh, 
plans in our algorithm uh, is recommended in EAU guideline except uh, uh, the Eurodynamic study because of lack of evidence. So no evidence is not meaning that uh, there, uh, we cannot do it because there is only the lack of evidence in this part. So let's go to the first step like uh, pelvic floor muscle training. There is only uh, six good, uh, almost good study for pelvic floor muscle training in PPI. And you can see it uh, for the positive res response, we have only uh, 487 patients with slightly better response than placebo, but the two other studies uh, is against this. And you can see the uh, level, uh, the uh, risk of bias in the as, uh, studies and, and it's mostly unclear or almost uh, moderate uh, risk of biases. And regarding uh, the uh, electrostimulation, it seems to uh, uh, have some add-on impact to pelvic floor uh, uh, muscle training. What uh, about the, the biofeedback? There is no effect of biofeedback in PPI and it's ineffective actually. And regarding the acupuncture, it, it can add some impact to medication or pelvic floor muscle training as well. So for medical treatment, as I told you, there is a good, strong evidence regarding treatment of urgency incontinence after prostatectomy with different medication like antimuscarinix or beta triagonist and so. But regarding the duloxetine, for increasing the resistance of outlet, we don't have enough studies. I just want two studies. It's one from 2011, and the other one is 2007, and both of them are lacking regarding the bias and what they show that uh, uh, doloxetine might be effective in those patients, but still we, are, we, we need uh, more uh, studies. We're a good population because of high uh, risk, uh, high uh, incidence of complications. So based on EAU guideline, uh, you can uh, see that uh, we can uh, recommend pelvic floor muscle training, electrostimulation or for a patient with PPI, but not uh, recommend the biofeedback. And in addition, we can, uh, uh, for, for, we can use duloxetine in these patients, but their uh, grade of recommendation is weak. Again, the grade of recommendation is weak and shows a lack of evidence. So uh, again, I, uh, I focused uh, for the evaluation of stress urinary incontinence when we have failed uh, uh, um, outcome in, for the first step. So in the second step, uh, we have to do a cystoscopy, urethral cystoscopy, and uh, we can do urodynamic in this phase as well. In my experience in this phase, I always do a urodynamic because I think it's helped me a lot. So in mild, and moderate, mild to moderate uh, incontinence, uh, we, uh, we should have a, a um, good cystoscopy. Why we are doing a cystoscopy? There is two reasons. First of the all, we would like to know, is there any bio bladder outlet abstraction uh, that we have to uh, um, resolve it? And uh, the second very important thing that we are doing the urethrocystoscopy is co-optation of the proximal urethra with repositioning. And we put our finger under the, the bulbar urethra and uh, uh, repositioning uh, the urethra. And we can see, I don't know if I can show, uh, yeah, no. um, can you click on the uh, right side uh, video? No, no, the, the next one. Yeah, just 
Just click on the uh, right side photo. The next one, no? You no, know, no, the before this, before, before, uh -huh. yeah, yeah, that's one. You can see the cooptation of urethra when you are repositioning uh, the uh, uh, urethra. If the cooptation were more than one centimeter, so it's good, and we could, you can use fixed uh, uh, sling for mild to moderate patients. But if the cooptation was less than one centimeter, uh, usually we prefer to do adjustable uh, sling or uh, uh, artificial sling there. But there is another problem in, in between, and if the patient had any history of radiation, pelvic radiation, or history of failed uh, surgery, like failed sling or failed AOS, we cannot use the fixed uh, uh, sling for such patients. Okay, so if the coaptation is less than one centimeter, the best choice can be uh, adjustable, uh, uh, male sling or uh, AUS. And for uh, the, uh, if uh, we don't have uh, in, uh, any uh, problem regarding uh, the moderate or mild to moderate incontinence, then uh, uh, then the, uh, the, but if the incontinence is very severe, we directly go to the AUS. So uh, the, regarding bulking agent, I have to say there is no evidence for, for a standard bulk, uh, injection of by bulking agent in such patients. And so it's, uh, 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 currently uh, EAU guideline is not recommended. About male sling, for fixed sling that we are putting uh, uh, say, under the uh, bulbar uh, urethra to just push it uh, uh, to uh, both sides, uh, obturator uh, um, from in, uh, we can uh, say, uh, you can see the uh, technique, and uh, we have to make sure about that like, good dissection, keeping uh, all the uh, muscles and put the sling on the muscles and not on the urethra. So uh, the best way one for this uh, technique uh, is advanced, uh, but uh, from Boston Scientific, but there is some other uh, uh, fixed slings, the companies as well, but uh, with lower evidences. So the um, success rate of uh, male sling is between eight, um, 0.3 to uh, 87% again because uh, of unstandard uh, definition of cure and uh, continence. But uh, regarding uh, the side effect, uh, the most uh, important side effect are pain in 1.3 person, and the second common uh, problem uh, for those patients are retention. So you can see there is lots of cohorts or case series for male sling, but almost there is no trial in this field. That's why we cannot find a high quality evidence with lots of heterogeneity in those studies. And in, uh, in uh, overall, um, the rate of uh, continence after a sling can be around 50%, and complication rate is around uh, 18%. So about adjustable, again, uh, the, the adjustable uh, sling uh, can be used in very limited indications. And there is different adjustable uh, uh, te techniques, uh, and, you, uh, and you can see there is more complication for these patients. And um, I have more experience with the uh, remix, and uh, actually I don't like it so much, but I uh, use it if I need it. So regarding Atom from Austria, actually there is some evidences for the efficacy of Atom, but again, EAU guideline is not recommended Atom yet. So regarding the compressive devices in our 
limited time that I have, I, can, I have to say uh, AUS is the best choice for these patients, and the continence rate after AUS uh, is between 61 to 100 person. So uh, the point is the long uh, time, um, uh, the, the long time efficacy of AUS is around 60 person again, and uh, we have um, actually uh, more. Um, some uh, side effects uh, around 20 persons of side effect or uh, re um, uh, surgery for these patients. So there is different kind of uh, the uh, AOA, uh, uh, AUS that I, um, I, as you know, MS-800 and new generation of MS-800 is very popular, but recently we are using the Zephyr. Zephyr is the, the new uh, um, uh, AUS, uh, that the uh, ball, um, pump and balloon both are in scrotal place. So the complication of uh, gener uh, the mean uh, general complication of uh, AUS is around 26 percent, but uh, again, AUA guideline strongly recommend uh, this uh, procedure for uh, moderate to severe incontinence. So. Uh, Finally, I would like to talk about recurrent incontinence after any procedure. For example, a recurrent incontinence after a sling or recurrent incontinence after EUS. If you have any recurrent sling, recurrent incontinence after uh, a sling, then uh, you can uh, choose uh, based on the problem, uh, AUS or re-sling for such patients. But remember, uh, we have to focus on uh, if there was any erosion, we have to wait uh, and treat the erosion first. If you have any near recurrence uh, in uh, the AUS, firstly, we have to uh, do focus uh, in technical problems like leak of, of the balloon and the other thing. And there, if there, is, there was not any technical problem, then we, are, we can uh, do a urodynamic studies uh, to, uh, to make sure for any functional uh, problem. And uh, uh, we have to do a cystoscopy to recognize the erosion. For anyway, if you have if you have any uh, problem regarding uh, the uh, string string insufficiency again, we can uh, uh, downgrade uh, the uh, the cuff or or we can uh, uh, we can put a double uh, cuff for such patients. Uh, can we do any sling after AUS after failed AUS? The, the answer is yes. So the, 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 final, the final slide is about the, the non-compressive uh, method for, uh, and uh, it's kind of non-circumcisional uh, pattern for uh, just compressing the urethra from both sides. Uh, I think this system is from Austria again, uh, but it's not uh, uh, using too much, and there is uh, uh, just limited evidence, and uh, uh, again, AUA is not recommended. So this is summary of any interventions uh, for uh, the uh, patient uh, with uh, post prostatectomy incontinence. And about future, uh, we can say ultrasound guided injection of fibroblast and myoblast into the sphincter and stem cell injection into the rhabdo uh, sphincter is one of the new approaches for such patients. Finally, this is my conclusion. Prevention is always better than treatment. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> just one comment. I think this talk, really in an excellent way, showed the complexity of the problem. Now, as we are here, and I think an important historical building, if you find any time, we have several thousand wax models of normal human anatomy 
and some of the oldest recorded demonstrations of the neurovascular bundle of the urethra, the anterior and posterior urethra, are documented on real corpses here in this building, one floor down in this direction. And you will see that, of course, we urologists or surgeons are known that it is mainly the expertise of the surgeon that decides the problem. But when you see the complexity of that, I mean, there are 19th century models here of normal human beings which clearly show the neurovascular bundles, the vasculature of the urethra. It is impressive and it's not surprising that this is such a complex image. So if you have the time, come and see this. It is nowhere in the world. We all tend to have our ideas who invented neurovascular bundles for the prostate. But here it was 200 years before that and clearly demonstrated what you can't do. And so have a look at this, and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Good. Uh, can I think I? Could, yes, please. Uh, as I told you at the beginning of my uh, lecture, we have a, a small uh, celebration, and someone to, to congratulate not right now. Uh, before uh, this celebration, I would like uh, to show a very shorter video about the, uh, uh, our university our, and our city, and it, maybe it's good for you to historically uh, know by, where we are. <laughs> okay, can you show our video, please? The city of Tabriz. Look The city of Tabriz, located in the East Azerbaijan province in the northwest of Iran, has been chosen as the capital of this country many times in the course of history, thus making it the home to many firsts. From the first women's national society to the first kidney transplant surgery in the country, Tabriz has earned its nickname as the city of firsts quite impressively. This city has also taken many primary steps in medicine. The first open heart surgery, the first medical student to be sent abroad, the first officially published medical book, and the first vaccinations for chickenpox in Iran are just a small part Tabriz has had in the improvement of this field. Tabriz's footprint upon medical education goes way back to the 13th century when Rabbi Rashidi Educational Campus opened its doors for scholars from around the world. With the founder being a physician himself, the importance of the Faculty of Medicine grew tenfold, and the campus hospital drew a lot of attention as the director, among treating patients, taught the students all he knew. Unfortunately, time wasn't very kind to this historical university, and it slipped off the mind. Years later, around 1946, Tabriz University started its activity as the second medical and basic sciences university in the country. The professors were chosen from the most prestigious doctors and engineers in the region. Later, four Austrian professors were chosen to teach in four different courses in medicine. These professors later became the head of departments in the campus hospitals. Tabriz University continues making history to this day, with over 24,000 students studying in more than 85 different fields, and the Medical Sciences University operates together with Imam Reza Hospital, one of the 10 teaching hospitals in Tabriz Health System, educating more than 8,300 students and treating patients in more than 35 different departments. Furthermore, the urology department was founded around 1952 by Professor Mojir Mulavi and had a major hand in training young doctors in this field. It is now one of the biggest national referral centers for endourology, urooncology, urology, pediatric urology, kidney transplant, and it is the pioneer in female and functional urology in Iran, with 13 faculty members, 15 residents, and two clinical fellows. 
We await you here in our beloved city to serve you the most delicious cuisines, introduce you to our profound culture, and send you off with beautiful souvenirs, as it is impossible to visit the city of carpets and leave without one. The city... Thank you again. Uh, actually, uh, it was a great pleasure. It's uh, deeply <laughs> from my heart, great pleasure to know Professor Shariat during the last three, uh, three, um, three years, actually. And we had lots uh, of joint projects uh, with uh, Professor and with me for so many publications. So for this reason, I uh, am pleased to invite the Dean of Faculty of Medicine of Tabriz, Professor Sawadi uh, Oskui, to come come and have a sort of, please. Thank you so much. Greeting ladies and gentlemen, I am very happy is here and it's very nice to meet you. In these few years, we have had privilege to work with Professor Shariat and his team. Today, after more than a hundred joint publication and more than five, five joint clinical and basic sciences, project and program, I am thrilled to present this honorary professor award to the professor Shariat. Let this be a start on the many more success to that comes. Thank you so much and success for every one of you. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's a tremendous. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is a tremendous honor and pleasure, and it's going to be my outfit not only for today but for many days. Thank you very much. It's my true honor to work with you and your university and the wonderful faculty you have in your university. Professor Haji Ibrahimi has been not only a friend but also a teacher at our university for many years and her son as a partnership with the EBM, with the research center has been the source of many projects we have done together. Thank you very much, it's my tremendous. Thank you for Thank you. Oh, fantastic. Oh, fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Happy University, Medical Sciences. Thank you very much. It's a very big honor. I'm very honored. I'm very, very honored. Thank you very much. Wow. This is Christmas. Yeah, it is the golden handcraft of your database. It's oh my made God. with gold 24 karat. Thank you so much. Wow. Wow, this is really Christmas and uh, birthday in one, huh? Thank you so much. We can take one more picture. And thank you so much. Thank you very much. You. I'm really humble. Thank you very much. I'm very, very humble and very grateful. 
really, thank you so much. Wow. I will show that to my wife. She will say, uh, okay, you deserve something for all the hours you've been away for academia. But thank you very much. It is a pleasure to work with you and with everybody. Thank you for coming, for giving the lecture, being involved, and for this tremendous honor. I'm very touched. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We are a little bit behind our, our thing, and I'm a little bit speechless, but uh, we're very behind. And the next speaker I want to introduce to you is somebody very dear to me, Brian is a very, 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 very close friend of mine. We've uh, connected from the first year we met during the fellowship at Memorial Sloan Kettering. Brian is a gentleman scholar of the finest, of the highest caliber. He is unique in everything he does. Uh, Brian holds uh, the position of Chief of Urology at Brooklyn Hospitals. Uh, Brian is also the Chair of the Residency. He's been already during the fellowship and every time I met, very involved in uh, different topics of education, of, of partnership, of uh, this health disparities and many areas that are very important to how our society works well together, how we pass on knowledge and take care of each other. So he goes really deep of who he is, is how, what a great person and hum humanist he is. He's also the, the vice chair at the Sunny Dunn State uh, University where he's also a residency coordinator, uh, program director. Thank you so much for coming, Brian, and we're looking forward to your talk. <laughs> Thank you for the invitation, uh, Professor. And also, it's a pleasure to be here and to meet you, Professor Marburger, after hearing so much about you. And just following up on what we just saw, I think that that's evidence that we are all better when we work together. And I don't think that I could have had a better introduction to my talk. Today's topic is the urologist versus the medical oncologist and who should manage advanced disease. Uh, no financial disclosures. I'm a teamwork person, so of course I borrow a few slides from friends of mine, uh, Will Lowrance, uh, David Crawford, and Will uh, Aronson. And I bring you greetings from New York. Uh, New York is my home base. Uh, this is my home institution, uh, SUNY Downstate. And I also work at a public hospital just across the street, Kings County Hospital, which you can see here. Uh, with regards to our learning objectives today, I wanted to focus on why. There's a lot of stuff that we all do, but I don't know if we all think about why. I like to evaluate the impact of one's practice setting on how you perform. Three, does a multidisciplinary approach alter outcomes? And who should manage advanced disease? I know that we have lots of urologists in the audience, but a few medical oncologists too. Please don't take any shots at me. I'll start my talk by mentioning Simon Sinek, who is actually an author that I was just having a conversation about earlier today. Uh, I came across this book, Start With Why, and the concept of the golden circle. And if you think about it, all great leaders and organizations share three common traits. They're focused on why, they do something, how they do it, and what they produce. And when these are all in unison, the outcomes are fantastic. A clarity of why is incredibly important. One's purpose, cause, or belief. The discipline of how, how we care for patients day in and day out. And also the consistency of what. The what that we all seek are the best outcomes for our patients. Why did you become a urologist? As I travel around the world and meet colleagues like you, I'm always curious as to how do we all end up here, and I will share how I ended up here. This is actually a photo. I was maybe two or three years old, and this is my father. I was probably doing something that I wasn't supposed to be doing, and I was being disciplined. But this is important, and this led me to urology because I lost my father to metastatic prostate cancer when I was 15 years old. I had not yet finished high school, yet alone had grown into a young man, and I had lost the most important man in my life. And this led me down a path to urology, looking at prostate cancer, doing prostate cancer work, and try to impact the lives of others, because I would hate for people to lose loved family members earlier than they need to. And I gotta admit, I may be a little selfish, Part of my interest in prostate cancer may be due to a desire to save my own life, because as we all know, 
Uh, prostate cancer runs in families, and those who have family members who have died from aggressive disease at an early age or at an uh, increased risk. So we will see. God willing, I will not face the same path, but if I do, please reach out for your clinical trials. So when we look at the natural progression of prostate cancer over time, when we're dealing with metastatic cash rate resistant disease, median lifespan, about two and a half years or so, and this is important to me here. I focused on this because this is sort of where my dad left us. But when that happened, we did not have the same therapies that we have available today for managing advanced disease. Again, you can make it to metastatic cash rate resistant disease through various pathways as seen here. And metastatic prostate cancer is actually going up. What you have here is you have uh, the National Cancer Database in America showing the incidence of metastatic prostate cancer from, you know, 2004 to 2015 and from a projection from 2015 on. And what you can see is that the incidence of metastatic prostate cancer is actually going up, especially after the U.S. Preventative Service Task Force changed their recommendation and they recommended against routine prostate cancer screening. Also, access to care has become a problem. This was an abstract from the most recent American Urological Association meeting in New Orleans back in May, I believe, and it showed that access to urologists is actually decreasing across the United States, and this is happening all around the world. There's a shortage of urologists. There's also a shortage of medical oncologists. This led me to start looking at underserved populations worldwide, because I thought about what I faced as a kid in Philadelphia, what I faced in New York and Brooklyn where I work, and this led me to look at underserved populations around the world, whether in Asia, South America, Europe, Australia. And I just wanted to see how do other people do things? Because again, we're better together when we collaborate and work together to solve the world's problems, in healthcare, that is. This led me to Belo Horizonte. Belo Horizonte is probably the fifth largest city in Brazil. Um, it has a population diversity that mirrors that of Brooklyn. There are about 2.6, 2.7 million people there. And I went there because I wanted to look at how our Brazilian colleagues delivered care to the underserved. And I was inspired by this movie, actually, City of God, released in 2002, one of my favorites. And it examined how people lived in favelas. Favelas are very underserved areas within Brazil. They're sort of areas where you have these jerry-built shacks lying on the borders of a city. If you've ever been to Rio, you could be on Copacabana Beach or Leblon or Ipanema Beach and see up and see the favelas. But anyway, this led me to look at different practice settings and what is the impact of that on the availability of a medical oncologist. Because there are lots of our colleagues who practice, they do surgery, but they don't have the medical oncology colleagues to work along with them. So main determining factors, whether or not you work in an urban versus rural area, academic versus private practice, or if you're in an area where it's considered to be research rich or research poor. A uh, professor and I worked in a research rich area uh, for our training at Memorial Sloan Kettering, and it made me think, what can I take from Memorial and take to communities like Brooklyn to make things better? So looking at the advanced prostate cancer patient population, of course, biochemical recurrence, castrate resistant, non-castrate resistant, you know, multidisciplinary patient care has been highlighted as guaranteeing the best outcome for these patients. There's some data from Jefferson as well as other uh, institutions showing that a multidisciplinary approach to care is what's best. And that consists of a urologist, a medical oncologist, a GU pathologist, a radiation oncologist, a genetic counselor and palliative care specialist, and I would also add a mental health professional because the diagnosis of prostate cancer, advanced prostate cancer, and dealing with disease, it places a strain not only on the patient but also the family. Uh, you know, these are the uh, advanced prostate cancer uh, guidelines per the AUA, ASTRO, and Society of Urologic Oncology. Not going to go into much detail with that. We can all review that online. But the key thing that I wanted to focus on is future directions, and in particular, the importance of the integration of multidisciplinary care. This will optimize treatment selection, maximize results, minimize over-treatment, 
and also to manage the side effects. This was an uh, uh, abstract from the AUA which made me think about what can we do better. Are urologists using all of the tools that we have in our armamentarium? And that answer is not really. It really depends on the stage. So with this, they wanted to look at real-world treatment patterns for hormone-sensitive metastatic disease and non-metastatic castrate-resistant disease. They broke things up into four groups, and they looked at what urologists did versus what medical oncologists did. The four groups, novel hormone therapy, antiandrogens, ADT, and chemotherapy. This is the key thing. When it comes to non-metastatic castrate-resistant disease, we all perform similarly. However, when looking at metastatic hormone-sensitive prostate cancer, there was a greater use of novel uh, therapy compared amongst the medical oncologists versus the urologists. And to me, this is evidence that we are indeed better together. Although urologists can manage advanced disease in this day and age of oral therapies, I don't know if that's necessarily the best thing. Again, the best outcomes come from working together. And this has led to some interesting things. You have folks looking at whether or not you know, novel, neovad, novel hormonal therapy in the neoadjuvant setting has an impact. We'll see where this goes. Um, and not only uh, is this important in the management of prostate cancer, but also kidney cancer. If you look here, this was the kidney cancer paradigm, say, in 2000 or so. Uh, the medical oncologist kind of comes in at the end when someone has advanced disease, whereas now with a multidisciplinary approach to the care of patients with kidney cancer, we're noting better outcomes. And again, I've mentioned prostate, I've mentioned kidney, and this when we're looking at locally advanced ure urethral malignancies. Patients do better when there's a multidisciplinary approach. So just to conclude things, take home points. Practice setting often dictates practice patterns. Uh, two, a multidisciplinary approach is preferred for advanced urologic cancers. Three, we should all become more familiar with our regional health networks, because if you don't have the access to a specialist yourself, it's beneficial to know who you can refer someone to. And lastly, urologists should become more familiar with the side effects of agents used for the management of advanced disease. Uh, I would say in the last year or two, I've become sort of an expert on managing hypertension, looking for signs of arthritis, and other sort of common side effects from some of the uh, novel hormonal therapies, not to mention diabetes. So thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your attention. I would also like to bring greetings to you on behalf of the Urology Care Foundation. The Urology Care Foundation is the official foundation of the American Urological Association, and I sit on the board of directors. And just a reminder that as we all sort of address urologic disease in our communities, patient education is important, research is important, and also humanitarianism and sharing resources is incredibly important. Thank you for your time. Fantastic. Uh, um, Brian, the first moment I met Brian, I knew this man's going to make a huge difference in the world. But not like many of us through working on a small niche, but having a big humanitarian impact on the people he meets and changing structures that so that the world can really enjoy those discoveries in a broad and equal access matter. Uh, thank you very much for that, Brian. Uh, and I'm very happy you came to Vienna because we've been so long, fantastic, and close friends. Finally, I got you here, and I, gotta, I hope we can get to you more often here. Questions? Ganesh has a question here from American to American. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Cheryl. Wonderful presentation, Brian. I'm curious, in your program in New York, do your urology trainees, your residents, get experience and education on the management of advanced prostate cancer? And if, if so, from whom? Urologists or medical oncologists? Great question. So our resident trainees do get some exposure to the management of advanced disease, both from urologists and medical oncologists. Part of our training program involves our residents going to spend time at the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. So they're there for four months as junior residents, 
and they also serve four months as an active fellow during which they may spend time on the medical oncology service. I think each model has a different structure, each environment, as you said, and uh, probably really getting the best people to the, uh, to the table. And, and we see it sometimes is a urologist, sometimes is a medical oncologist, sometimes is, is different people from bit different backgrounds. But trying, the more people you have to think, more diverse actually backgrounds people think, as you said, and we often discuss this, about the same problems, the richer is gonna be the solutions to the problem, right? By the way, Simon Sinek has been a Bible for all of us, and I think uh, if you have that initial why you do it, then you're not thinking about what is your background or things, if you're a urologist, medical oncologist, or anything else. It's bringing the people with the why together, right? That matters to solve the issue. Thank you so much for being with us. I think he's, he's, uh, he's gonna be tonight at the party. Many people I wanna will. have a glimpse of his magic. He has a lot of magic, I tell you. He's definitely put the magic on me, and thank you so much for being with us, Brian. Thank you. Thank you. So it is, it is kind of funny. When you do a meeting, you, 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 when you put the program together, you say, okay, I wanna have at the end of the year all my friends together from the international community of urology. But they have to be all brilliant and excellent. It happens that I have a few of them, and one of them is Dimitri. Dimitri is from the Sechenov University and has been with us in, as an adjunct professor for now two years and has been a very highly active partner in research. We've done a lot of projects together. We've published together. We've done conferences together. He's also a man uh, that uh, transcends um, I really believe transcends specialty technologies and everything else by looking at very incredible innovative solutions, how to deliver best care and taking a very different road. Uh, he does a lot of focal ablation, novel technologies, tulium laser, and the topic I asked him to I asked him to talk about tulium fiber laser because he not only uses tulium fiber laser, he researched it and brought it from you know, a technology that was just discovered somewhere to really the intricacies of daily use. So thank you so much, Dimitri, for being with us today. Thank you very much. Thank you for a kind introduction. Dear friends, dear colleagues, today I was asked to discuss more on laser technologies and focus on thulium fiber laser. And I would like to start my presentation with ideas to just champion that you cannot mandate productivity. You must simply give people the appropriate tools to let them become their best. And today, lasers have become such a tool for urologists. We use them for BPH, for different cancers, and of course, for lithotripsy. Before we start to discuss modern laser technologies, I would like to draw your attention on how lasers work. It is important to understand the difference between them. Uh, the basic principle is always the same. Energy source pumps energy into the crystal between mirrors. Energy increases, then one mirror is opened, laser beam appears and goes to the fiber. While mechanism is always the, the same, lasers differ in their crystals. And each crystal has its own wavelength. And the wavelength determines whether energy is absorbed by water or by hemoglobin. For example, such crystal as KTP in grid light laser, its energy is absorbed by hemoglobin, so it's ineffective against stones. Conversely, such crystals as thulium and holmium, their energy is absorbed by water, and this is exactly what we need for lithotripsy. A little bit later, I will explain why. Another important point it is operation mode. It can be continuous when energy hits the target and pulse when it fires intermittently. And this is also what we need for lithotripsy. So once again, why do we need energy that is absorbed by water and what makes lithotripsy possible? To answer this question, we need to know the composition of the stone. This is a picture of the real kidney stone, and you may see that it consists of many pores, and there is a water between these pores. So there are two, two mechanisms of action, thermal and mechanical. At first, laser energy hits the stone surface and the water inside the stone. It changes the structure of the stone, it becomes brittle, and then mechanical effect destroys the stone. That's it. Having appeared more than 25 years ago, Holmium Yak laser quickly became the king of soft tissue surgery and lithotripsy, but time does not stand still. Novel technology is developing very fast. In 1986, 
Moses effect was first described. And now it got a second wind. So I will try to explain the difference between laser with Moses and without. A Holmium laser without Moses makes a single pulse which travels through the vapor tunnel. A laser with Moses effect at first make a short pulse which creates the vapor tunnel and then the second pulse which destroys the stone. The developers of this technology found that it reduced retropulsion and as a result of reducing retropulsion, dusting became more effective. A recent meta-analysis was published by Esteban Emiliani and Jean Pelou. They found no significant difference in stone for aid, in operation time, in laser on time, in complication rate, but basis on surgeon's opinion, retropulsion was less. So what do we need for, from lasers today in our clinical practice? So, in stone treatment. So first of all, of course, we want it to be more effective, to have less retropulsion. And of course, uh, amazing talk by Professor Sariga. So when the era when endoscopes are becoming smaller and smaller, we need laser fibers that would fit them. And we will talk about it. So and while we're waiting for that, changes, full and fiber laser appeared. It was first described in, 90, 20, in 2010 by Nathaniel Fried. And the first machine was developed in 2017, and we presented our first in vitro trial during EU meeting. It was awarded as the best uh, poster in stone ses session. So its main advantage is its wavelength. It's 1.94 micrometers, and it precisely matches the peak of water absorption, which is the major tissue component that absorbs laser energy. And that machine became the prototype for all other thulium fiber lasers, which are now widely used in in the world. So once again, it's very important to see the difference between thulium fiber and thulium yak laser. It's absolutely two different technologies we cannot compare them. Only the crystal, the thulium is the same. So different way thing. Another important advantage that thulium fiber laser can work in both pulse quasi-continuous mode, and it is optimal for soft tissue surgery, and supra pulse mode, and it is optimal for Litotripsy, while thulium yak laser only in continuous wave mode. And the last but not the least, air cooling system in contrast to all other lasers that use water cooling. So it makes it lighter, more compact, quieter. So you may see this machine in, in, in that part of the, our hall. So it's like comparison of fold and molding computers. So let's look inside the laser. The whole memo thulium yak device combines output of several flash lamp pump Holmium and thulium yak crystal lasers into one surgical fiber. As for the thulium fiber laser, different in this regard, it uses, uses about 30 meters of active thulium fiber, which pumped by a small diet laser as a laser source. That's all. Once again, this machine can work in both in pulse quasi continuous mode, and it is optimal for soft tissue surgery. Can we use it for lithotripsy? Yes, we can, but it will be not so effective. And it also can work in supra pulse mode. It is optimal for lithotripsy. Can we use supra pulse mode for soft tissue surgery? Yes, we can. But it, it will, will have Holmium-like effect. It will rupture the tissue with a stream of vapor bubbles. So this picture we, we can see. Pulse quasi-continuous mode, uh, long pulse. Ablation is not effective. So it, we just ablate the stone. And vice versa with short pulse, with supra pulse mode, lithotripsy is very, very effective. So before we started using our clinical practice, there was a serious uh, in vitro trials in our laser lab. So at first, of course, we were interested in its efficacy. And for that, we made a special setup. What we did, we made a special setup. We put a cuvette with one millimeter mesh on the bottom, put it in another cuvette, filled it with water. Uh, here we have inflow and outflow. And all the process uh, in the inner cuvette that we will put a stone and introduce laser fiber and perform lithotripsy. All the process was recorded with a high speed camera. Can we start the video? So, this is how it was. This is how it was with a high speed camera. And what we found? So, what we found that in dusting mode and in fragmentation with high pulse rate, thulium fiber laser was two times more effective than Holmimiak laser. Another aspect was retropulsion. So for that, we also use a special setup. So we make two rulers, put them into the water, put a stone between these two rulers, and in the middle, we introduce laser fiber. All the process also was recorded with a high-speed camera. This is how it was. We perform one pulse. 
And we found that retropulsion with thulium fiber laser was two times less than with holmium yak laser. Sometime later, Olivier Traxer compared thulium fiber laser with holmium yak laser with Moses effect. And even with Moses effect, retropulsion was two times less with, whole, uh, with thulium fiber laser. Safety, temperature changes during latitripsy. Hot topic. So for that, we use a setup from the first experiment. But what, what we also add, we add thermocouples in the inflow, outflow, and close to the stone. And measure temperature changes. And we found that there was no serious temperature changes during latitripsy with holmium and with thulium fiber laser. First clinical trial was conducted. What we found? We found that, first of all, that thulium fiber laser was effective in all stone densities. Stone free rate at three months was 92.5% in regular rate surgery and 85% on PCNL. We found optimal regimens for retrograde surgery, 0.5 joule and 30 hertz for dusting, for fine dusting, 0.50 joule and 200 hertz and op also optimal regimens for PCNL. Now, most of them are recommended by the manufacturers. Our first randomized clinical trial was also done by, conducted by our colleagues from Norway. 120 patients were involved, and they found that stone free rate in three months was better with thulium fiber laser, 92% versus 67%. Even complication rate was better after using thulium, thulium fiber laser. What about future? Laser fibers. So we know that with Holmium Yak laser, due to its technology, 200 la micron laser fiber is the minimum we can get. With thulium fiber, we can use up to 70 micron laser fiber. But this is for the future. Now we have 150 micron laser fiber, and we conducted an in vitro trial compared with 200 micron. What we found that in terms of red repulsion, safety, and ablation rate, they are absolutely comparable. But 150 laser micro, uh, 50 micron fiber has the potential to decrease particle size in lithotripsy, and we know how it is important in dusting. We should mention it, of course, a new pulse thulium yak laser also now appeared, and this is the first yak laser, pulse laser, that is available for lithotripsy. Our uh, first in vitro data now is available, so we know that uh, in in vitro trials, in dusting, it is comparable with, comparable with thulium fiber laser and uh, better than holmium yak. In fragmentation, the researchers showed that it is comparable with holmium yak, but better than uh, thulium fiber. But of course, we need, uh, we are looking forward to seeing first clinical trials on this topic, and um, we'll see how it will be in the future. So this brings me to the end of my presentation. I would like to sum up that now we have modern technology that is now is uh, frequently used in our clinical practice with minimal retropulsion, with superior performance in dusting, and of course the potential of smaller fibers in its use. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much. Questions? Thank you very much for the super nice talk. Um, since you have uh, one of the most experienced uh, with this kind of laser, can you share a little bit, a little bit uh, of your pre-settings or laser settings for different uh, um, entities like stones or um, tumor ablation? Thank you very much for your, your, your question. So, well, I think uh, one of the most important aspects of using thulium fiber laser uh, is Unblock resection for non-muscle veins and bladder tumors, first of all, due to its penetration depth. We know that the penetration depth of thulium fiber laser is just 0 0.15 millimeters, so it allows us for very delicate and precise separation of bladder wall. So, and the settings for unblock resection is uh, energy is 1.0 joule and 10 watts, and this is optimal for uh, bladder cancer surgery. If we talk about uh, BPH, so uh, there are several works that show that it is easier to learn endoscopic regulation of the process. We know that this now is a preferable option for BPH treatment, we know. And it's easier to learn uh, endoscopic regulation with uh, thulium fiber laser due to its good cutting properties. So, and the settings for BPH surgery is 1.5 joule and 50 to 60 watts. 
Uh, if we work in the sphincter area with delicate settings, we can uh, decrease the energy to 30 watts. So this is the most optimal uh, settings uh, for soft tissue surgery. Thank you so much. Uh, one thing I want to say, I know your daughter is here. You can be really proud of your father. He's an amazing, incredible man. So thank you so much, Dimitri, for coming. Dimitri is going to help us over the next year also with Kemal and so on to get the tulium into the practice with all the people here and use it in our daily uh, practice and uh, develop research projects. Thank you so much, thank you. Dimitri. Thank you for coming. We're going to take a 15 minutes break. We are behind schedule, but I think no good party ends on time. So <laughs> we are a little bit behind. Let's come back at 30, please. At 30 for the second session of oncology. Thank you very much.
Dear friends, we're going to continue. I know everybody is in a Christmas mode, but Christmas has not begun yet. You have to earn it. Please come back. The second session will be focused on oncology. Unfortunately, I have to ask the second session speakers to be even more rapid so we can make it on time to the event we have afterwards. Second session is based on oncology. The first speaker needs no introduction. He's a tremendous friend. We met in Vienna, actually, many years ago at the meeting, and we connected. It was like love on the first sight. We both love bladder cancer. He's been the head of the guidelines for many, many years, and he's the head of the Department of Urology in Prague at the University Motol Hospital. He's uh, at Charles University. He's also been the president of the Czech, Repub uh, Czech Urologic Association. He's really moved the Czech Association and the Central European Association in which we are together to the next level. I'm very proud to introduce to you uh, Marco Babchuk. Really, nobody better to talk about what happens after BCG if it doesn't work. Dear Sharok, thank you very much for introduction. Dear Professor Marberger, dear friends, it's really a pleasure to be here after years again, and it's wonderful. Uh, and congratulations for the fantastic meeting that you organized for all of us, as always, and I'm really happy to be here. I should talk about uh, the future in the treatment of BCG unresponsive non-muscle invasive bladder, and uh, this is, of course, the topic which uh, I hope uh, well, we will see in the near future a lot of new uh, products and uh, a lot of new inter interesting treatment modalities. But it is maybe not true just for uh, BCG unresponsive, but the whole area of uh, non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. Talking about the BCG unresponsive, we, of course, believe that BCG is uh, still the, the main stone in the intravesical treatment for patients with uh, non-muscle invasive bladder cancer, particularly high-risk and intermediate-risk tumors. And we know this is, until now, the only treatment modality which can reduce the risk of tumor progression and which uh, uh, results are uh, excellent, in fact. Here, lower, you can see uh, the, the current data presented by the group around Ashish Kamat, uh, the five-year progression-free survival, 92% uh, uh, in uh, uh, high uh, and intermediate risk tumors. So this is apparently, apparently excellent data. But in spite of that, we know that BCG may fail in some patients. Uh, there is another very important point. Uh, talking about BCG unresponsive tumors, we need to uh, remember and use the definition, which is uh, particularly in, uh, because we'll talk about new products, the products under development. So we need to remember the definition by uh, scheduling the trials. And uh, the definition try to, tries to define those patients who, where the continued BCG is unlikely to provide benefit. And it is based on three uh, important parameters. First is the pathology. It should be the high-grade tumor after BCG. This is the timing of persistence or recurrence of the tumor, uh, as it is in the definition. And this is also the amount of BCG which was used before uh, to uh, be sure that we really exhausted the capacity, the treatment uh, capacity of, the, of BCG. So don't remember the definition and, uh, because it is important, particularly in evaluation of new, 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 new drugs. Uh, there is no doubt that uh, the BCG unresponsive tumors are life-threatening disease, and uh, the standard treatment, even now, uh, is, although Sharok said that we are not interested in guidelines today, but still, uh, you should remember that, and uh, the radical cystectomy is standard treatment. It is oncologically safe. On the other hand, we know but that this is over-treatment, probably, for some of our patients. 
We have several alternative options. I will talk about that. There are many of them. They are apparently effective in some patients. On the other hand, if it is not effective, it can be connected with the risk of tumor progression. We should not forget this field uh, where we are now. And what is also important to know, because as I said, we will talk about new products, and I will talk mostly about cohort studies, single arm studies. Uh, and uh, mm, the reason is that it is very difficult to include and enroll patients in the trials in this disease stage. And that's why the FDA accepted uh, the, the mm, uh, single arm phase two trial design for, uh, for the registration studies or for studies. Uh, um, and they also specify the meaningful outcome. But there is, uh, which is about 40 to 50 percent uh, complete response in BCG unresponsive carcinoma in situ. Uh, this is also debated today, but this is the, the, the situation now. So which perspective options we have? There are some categories. First, we have some systemic treatments. There are some intravesical installations. And there are ongoing sun trials even on radiation treatment. So what about the, uh, the systemic treatment? This is the uh, well-known, probably the Keynote 057 was the trial evaluating pembrolizumab, systemic pembrolizumab in uh, BCG unresponsive non-muscle invasive tumors. Uh, uh, you may see uh, quite interesting complete response in a carcinoma in situ, uh, which was uh, uh, around 40%, which was quite durable. Based on that, the FDA approved uh, 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 this drug for this indication. Uh, on the other hand, this is systemic treatment. It is not without side effects. We know all know that. And uh, to my knowledge, it is not so frequently used e in the U.S., even if it is approved. What is maybe more interesting is the combination of local and systemic treatment. For me, it sounds logic. Uh, and because maybe uh, we may undertreat uh, systemically some of these tumors, uh, this is just uh, dose escalation phase one trial on combination of intravesical BCG uh, with uh, intravenous pembrolizumab. There is a phase three trial ongoing, we will see. Uh, what about intravesical treatments? First of all, we well understand the intravesical chemo and cytotoxic treatments, but there are several new approaches in this area. First, it is the combination of drugs, of new, of new modern drugs. For instance, the combination of gem, uh, gemcitabine with docetaxel, with sequence installation. Uh, uh, there were published some data, but it is mostly retrospective and on a little bit heterogeneous cohort, so it is very difficult to, uh, to make some final judgment. Uh, there are even uh, ongoing trials with three drugs installations. I am not aware about a paper until today. What is maybe more interesting are the new drug deliveries. Uh, for instance, this is the STAR-200, uh, which is the device which you insert into the bladder and which uh, allows the slow release of, uh, uh, of docetaxel in this case. Uh, the, 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 the release can take for seven days. So there is seven days activity of the drug on the bladder mucosa. It is very interesting, I think. There is ongoing the Sunrise 1 trial, uh, three-arm trial, which combines uh, uh, again the, the intravesical treatment with uh, uh, systemic uh, cetrolimab. Uh, uh, we, we will see uh, what will come out. There are some more options uh, uh, with enhanced or new drug deliveries. Uh, it will be interesting to see uh, how it will be translated in better outcomes. Uh, what is well uh, relatively more established and in fact the only routinely available uh, treatment modality today, which I will talk about, are the, are the device-assisted installations. Uh, there are particularly uh, the, the installations uh, using the enhanced temperature 
There are basically two methods. First is TRITE, this is the radio frequency induced thermochemotherapy, uh, which uh, delivers hyperthermia directly on the bladder wall using the radio frequency. Uh, we believe that it, and it was confirmed in vitro that it improves cytotoxicity and drug absorption. So it is more expensive, but more sophisticated method. In contrary, we have also chemohyperthermia. This is HIVEC, for instance, and there are more tools, more, more uh, companies producing that, which, uh, where is, which is easier, simpler, and uh, it, uh, it is based just on the increase of temperature of, of circulating mitomycin. So, but in both devices, you need the device and you need a special catheters for, uh, special catheters for that. What about results? They are very controversial concerning Krite, for instance. There are negative results from the human trial, but there were not uh, uh, included patients, uh, just patients with BCG unresponsive. It didn't respect it, this, this category, uh, when the uh, trial was scheduled. Uh, so it is difficult. The results were even negative comparing to uh, institutional standard, which was mostly uh, second course of BCG. Uh, we don't know why, because it is in contrary to some other results. One explanation may be the dose of mitomycin which was used. Lower, you can say, uh, see the report from the long-term experience from Nijmegen, from Fred Vitius, who is using this device for, for many, many years, and they showed uh, better results if it is used with uh, uh, with ablative dose, which is higher, which is 40 milligram, two times 40 milligram mitomycin per session. Uh, so, uh, so maybe the dose may be important here. Uh, the HIVEC, we have only a retrospective data uh, published recently, not bad results, but again, this is retrospective and more or less cohort, uh, cohort results. There is one more option in, in the cytotoxic treatments, which is combination uh, of uh, combination of antibody with some drug conjugates. This is, for instance, this vicinium oportuzumab monatox, uh, which combines the single chain antibody, which is linked to pseudomonas exotoxin, which should induce apoptosis. Uh, the shore uh, presented some data in 2020, but it has not been published, and to my knowledge, it was not uh, approved by FDA. Uh, another option are immunotherapies, again, more very interesting uh, methods. Uh, first, I would like to mention this uh, 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 interleukin super agonist, uh, and 803, uh, which uh, was used in combination with, uh, with BCG. Uh, these are data presented by Dr. Shemi uh, from UCLA uh, at ASCO this year, and uh, uh, you can see an ex excellent complete response rate in uh, carcinoma in situ patients, which is, goes up to 70%. It is far the best result and durable result, so I think if this is really confirmed by other the groups, uh, it will be excellent. Uh, what is very interesting, it is uh, uh, again uh, a very modern and interesting method also from the principle, uh, from the point of view of the principle, which is nadofaragin firadeno, uh, firadenovec, which is gene therapy. This is the gene which is uh, transmitted into the host nucleus, and the cells inside the bladder, urothelial cells, start uh, to produce uh, to produce interferon for some time. We know that it is for about 10 days. The interferon has anti-tumor efficacy. So again, uh, quite interesting response rate uh, in carcinoma in situ. And this was published in Lancet Oncology two years ago. And uh, to my knowledge, this is now ongoing FDA approval debates and uh, the FDA just asked for some specification. Uh, the third option is uh, intravesical checkpoint inhibitors. This was very recently uh, uh, accepted in European urology. Phase one dose escalation uh, study with uh, intravesical BCG plus intravesical pembrolizumab uh, with probably acceptable toxicity, but this is just dose escalation we will see um, in the future. Uh, 
Uh, what about targeted therapies? I would just like just mention the erdafitinib, of course, for patients with uh, uh, with uh, FGFR mutations only. So this is only limited to this kind of patients. It is again combined with this uh, new delivery system. Uh, in this case, this is TAR 210. Uh, the study is ongoing, and we are waiting for results again. Just to mention the radio, uh, radiation, I'm a urologist, I'm not very, I'm quite critical and I don't believe the radiation uh, can be really very helpful in this kind of patients because of the, the complications and uh, uh, long-term side effects and so on. But still, there are trials ongoing and maybe we will be surprised in the future. There are some drugs under investigation like recombinant BCG, which should, uh, the genetically modified BCG, it, uh, it should uh, uh, reduce some uh, unnecessary side effects of BCG. Hopefully, we will see. And just back, uh, I still used one slide with guidelines. Um, just don't forget the in BCG unresponsive tumors, the, the cystectomy is still the treatment of choice. The guidelines gives you clear uh, recommendation what to do in individual categories of patients. And of course, an excellent option is to in, uh, enroll your patients in, in which are not candidates for cystectomy or refuse cystectomy to in, uh, enroll them in clinical trials. And uh, yeah, in conclusion, BCG is not effective in all cases. Uh, remember the definition of BCG unresponsive disease. Uh, the radical cystectomy is still a standard option, but there are new treatment modalities, and I am sure that it will find its field. Mm, looking on the results, the, the interleukin super agonist looks uh, very promising uh, as a very promising drug, but again, it should be conf uh, confirmed uh, by, by, uh, by other groups as well. And we will see. It will be interesting, I'm sure, in a few years. We have more options than we have today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Wonderful presentation on a, on a very hot, hotly uh, investigated area. Any questions, please? I would have a question is, you know, here you have systemic therapy, you have local therapy. I'm not talking about urologists and medical oncologists, but the disease seems to be very heterogeneous Right, PCG unresponsive is not equal. Do you think there's going to be a risk stratification? What type of PCG unresponsive even is, um, with the likelihood of systemic disease versus those that don't have systemic disease? That's the first question. The second question is, what is acceptable? They all show 30, 40 percent at one year. Is that good enough? And how many do we miss? Are we accepting to miss the window of opportunity compared to radical cystectomy? Uh, yeah, this is a couple of questions. Uh, <laughs> I of course, yeah. <laughs> okay, we can <laughs> postpone the dinner. Uh, 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 no, I I personally believe that first radical cystectomy is very invasive treatment, and uh, its results are not at far from optimal, even oncological results. So I am sure it will be re re reconsidered in the future. Uh, whether we should, and, and of course the problem of uh, non-muscle invasive and muscle invasive bladder cancer and all bladder preserving strategies in these aggressive uh, kinds of disease. The problem is the, the, the uh, low, uh, uh, low efficacy of uh, imaging modalities that we have. So in fact, we are treating something, uh, the disease, where we don't know exactly how extended it is. And we know that probably even in some T1 grade three tumors or high grade tumors, we can have already metastasis. But uh, this is probably, to my uh, opinion, the reason why uh, until we have better, better imaging modalities, we probably should consider systemic treatments in these patients. But we need uh, probably something better in imaging or in understanding the behavior of disease. More importantly, we know that uh, immunotherapies are effective, but only in selected patients, and the selection is difficult today, even for systemic disease. 
we will talk about it maybe later. And so this is, this is the problem. And whether these efficacy criteria are optimal, I think there is uh, not uh, uh, a discussion between Europe and US uh, whether really the single arm trials are acceptable for this kind of the disease, whether we really should not come back to, 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 uh, pros uh, to randomized uh, 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 more arm trials. I don't know, it is difficult. Uh, it will take more time, it will be very expensive and it will reduce the approach of these treatments in the real practice. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marco. picture with you and Professor Marburger, if that is okay. You know Professor Marburger for many years. It's Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's going to go into the photo album of the family. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Mar Marco. See you tonight. Thank you very much. So the next speaker is it's, it's almost, you know, as I told you, when a Christmas time comes, I'm saying, okay, who's, which friends are going to force to come to Vienna or invite them to come, but with a meeting because, you know, everybody's busy and have them come to Vienna and spend some time with us and share the knowledge, but also because I enjoy being around them. So Paolo is one other person in that really group of people that I really cherish. We also met many, many years ago, 2010 it was, I think, 2011 it was, we met and we shared the same passion for ureteric carcinoma. He is the chair at the university in Torino, professor there, and also the head of the hospital, and he's also the new chair of the new guideline of the guidelines of non-muscle invasive and upper tract as well. It's a real honor to have you with us, Paolo. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And his wife is also called Veronica, like my wife, so this is another point in common. <laughs> Thank you very much, dear colleagues and friends. Uh, Sherlock is a great honor for me to be here uh, today. And uh, I came across a city, Torino, that uh, this is a picture of uh, the city yesterday. Uh, it was a kind of a challenge, but I'm a little bit tired because I had to drive overnight to Milano. And, uh, but also, uh, it made me thinking that uh, uh, I came here, but the last time that you've been in Torino was 2016, and this is a picture with uh, Professor Babchuk. And I also reminded to Professor Marberg that he was in Torino in 2010, invited by my, my former chief. And um, here are my dis disclosure. So, uh, nephro-uretrectomy um, is, uh, is a standard treatment for high-risk uh, uh, upper tract urothelial uh, uh, cancer. And uh, I'm not going to talk uh, about uh, future avenues uh, like uh, new adjuvant, uh, adjuvant treatment because I'm in front of a giant of the field. So I will be, I will be addressing very simply uh, which is the preferred technique, and propose what we do in our institution, which is a little bit uh, against the common way of uh, thinking uh, nowadays. Uh, in the definition of high risk upper tract urethelia cancer, we have to realize that uh, we have hydronephrosis, uh, local invasion on CT that defines sometimes a locally advanced uh, urethelia cancer. However, we have to be very careful that there is a, a problem with understaging. And this comes into question whether minimally invasive uh, uh, surgical techniques for, uh, for doing nephroeutherectomy can be really safe. Whatever the technique we use, we have to respect oncological principle. You, we should not enter the urinary tract. Many would advise that you have to convert to open surgery. I don't think there is evidence that this should be done. Probably we could choose a safer approach to do a minimally invasive nephroeutherectomy that uh, could overcome the need uh, to, to, do, to convert to open surgery. And this is what I'm going to, to address. We have to avoid direct contact uh, between tumor and the instrument. We have to perform a lymphadenectomy. So minimally invasive cannot uh, be minimally surgery. So we have to replicate and respect all the oncological um, principles. And of course, the bladder cuff that we have to remove along with, uh, with the kidney. When we, look at, when we talk about oncological outcomes uh, in nephroeutherectomy, we have peculiar um, um, variables, uh, which are the intravesical recurrence and also we have to look for the risk of distant metastatic uh, 
diseases, uh, that is the same that uh, we, we think about any time we do minimally invasive surgery for urothelial cancer, which is an aggressive disease. And so the, the same questions comes when we talk about minimally invasive uh, cystectomy. If we compare, we look at the trial comparing OMBEN to laparoscopic nephro-urethrectomy. In this, that was the first systematic review. Obviously, as uh, you can imagine, uh, the majority of studies are retrospective. There's only one randomized study probably under power comparing uh, um, open with uh, uh, minimally invasive nephroyeretrectomy. And in this uh, uh, systematic review, the, um, the conclusion was, the, was that there was no difference in cancer-specific survival. However, it seems that if you do with the lap laparoscopically, you remove the bladder catheter, you have a higher risk of intravascular risk. So the conclusion was that we could not conclude for equivalence in terms of oncological efficacy. However, a later meta-analysis, again, this is a meta-analysis of retrospective studies, uh, which uh, in introduced uh, a larger series, actually found no difference in cancer-specific survival, and not even in intravascular uh, recurrence between uh, open or laparoscopic nephroyeretrectomy. And when in an additional review, 10,000 robotic uh, nephroyeretrectomies were added, uh, what was found is that there was no difference in outcomes between the different types of uh, minimally invasive uh, types of nephroyeretrectomies. Actually, in this meta-analysis, open nephroyeretrectomy was uh, had poorer outcomes, but this might uh, um, reflect a, a kind of, a, of a selection um, bias. But intracorporeal cuff, again, uh, was not associated with the high risk of recurrence. And here you can see how in, uh, when you do a robotic uh, nephroyeterectomy, in 100% of cases you do the blood cuff minimally invasive, whereas when the, the, the laparoscopic uh, approach only allows you to, to do this in up to 50% of cases. When we, we look uh, at uh, variables that could predict the accuracy of, uh, of uh, surgery, the so-called pentafecta, and this is a study for from Professor Sharat uh, uh, group, uh, uh, including uh, uh, recurrence-free at one uh, year, uh, margin-free, or absence of uh, complications. Again, no difference between open and uh, minimally invasive uh, uh, approach for nephroyeretrectomy. And here, I, I would like to show, so, what do we do then? How do we approach? Once that we have uh, defined that uh, um, there is no difference between uh, minimal invasive and uh, open nephroyeretrectomy. Well, uh, in our institution for the last two years, we have been describing a pure retroperitoneoscopic uh, uh, nephroyeretrectomy, including the bladder cuff. To do this technique, it is critical that uh, you medialize uh, the peritoneum. You see how you can isolate uh, the, the ureter. The reason why we medialize the peritoneum, and this, of course, uh, cannot be done, uh, for instance, if the patient has uh, had bridal surgery. The reason for doing that is because we change the optic when we go down to the ureter, and also we, we, we change the position, a little bit of the position. But we don't need the redocking, for instance, like you, you need when you do a robotic uh, approach. Here you see that uh, you are, we are already working on the um, pelvic uh, ureter, and then we stop at this time. The, uh, this is a, a lady, and then we go up uh, and we do the, the, the vessels. Unfortunately, I cannot uh, skip the, the, the video because uh, it's, uh, it's not possible. So you see the vessels. We don't, uh, we just clip and cut the, the, um, the kidney vessels but we do not isolate the kidney because then we will go back and I will show you later how we, we approach and we do the, the, the bladder cuff. But also the reason why, why um, we, we do that. Another point of discussion is uh, that uh, in case of a local advanced uh, nephro um, um, tract tumor, uh, the minimal invasive approach uh, may be unsafe. And uh, this is a weak recommendation from, uh, from the guideline, and it's based on a, on a, on a meta-analysis of uh, 10 studies, where actually four out of these 10 studies show that the, the outcome were poor for, for patients with a locally advanced disease. Conversely, 
uh, more recent, uh, uh, again, uh, uh, systematic review uh, could not actually demonstrate uh, that there was a, different, a statistically significant difference. But you can see the hazard ratio is 1.5. The difference is not statistically significant, but is not so far from being statistically significant. So I think that the, the message, the current view, is that we have to be very careful. And this is, for instance, a case serious, which is very worrisome if we think about minimal invasive uh, um, technique for, for nephroyetherectomy, because they compare open uh, surgery with uh, T3 laparoscopic uh, um, uh, laparoscopic nephroetherectomy in T3 disease. And what they found, actually, it was really a difference in favor of uh, uh, open surgery for cancer-specific survival and for intravesical uh, recovery. So at the moment, the jury is still out on whether we can safely use uh, minimally invasive uh, surgery for a locally advanced uh, uh, upper tract urothelial tumor. What about lymphadenectomy? Well, we do lymphadenectomy for staging because there, there is a, a significant impact of survival if the nodes are positive and this has treatment implications. Also, there is a poor uh, correlation uh, between clinical N0 and pathological N0. But what about uh, the potential curability of uh, lymphadenectomy? Well, this is controversial. It's based really on a low level of evidence. We know that uh, if you do a lymphadenectomy, you have better outcomes than if you don't do a lymphadenectomy. If you do a complete template of lymphadenectomy, probably in patients with a, with a local advanced disease, you might have uh, uh, better outcomes. But what is certain is that it, lymphadenectomy does not appear to be associated with the higher risk of complication. And so, when you do an, uh, um, an nephroetherectomy, you should always do a lymphadenectomy because if you have a high-grade disease, and this is the definition of a high-risk uh, upper tract tumor, you have a 30 to 35% risk of uh, having positive nodes, and the same if, if, is if you have a pathological T2 or, or more. I'm pretty sure that uh, nobody of us probably look at these uh, templates that have been described uh, on the way that you should do a lymphadenectomy. But what is uh, the message that uh, we have to convey is that if you do a minimally invasive technique, you have to be able to do the lymphadenectomy with respecting the templates. And if we can uh, have a look to the, to the video, I want to show you that uh, in our technique uh, with a pure uh, retroperitoneoscopic uh, nephroetherectomy, we can do the pelvic lymphadenectomy. At the same time, if you have a tumor in the lower ureter, you have to do a pelvic lymphadenectomy if you do a nephroetherectomy. And if you have a tumor in the mid ureter, you have to do a retroperitoneal lymphadenectomy combined with a pelvic uh, lymphadenectomy. I'm not, I, I cannot show you for the sake of, uh, of time also the way you can easily do a retroperitoneoscopic uh, um, uh, retroperitoneal lymphadenectomy with, uh, with this uh, same uh, technique. So you, you can see Again, it's not feasible in all, in all cases, but uh, you can do that. Uh, here you, we are going, uh, obviously, lateral to the vessels in order to expose the, the obturator nerve because uh, in that position is not so easy to, to, to be seen uh, completely. And, uh, but you, you can really have a very good sampling of uh, pelvic uh, nodes uh, by using this, uh, this uh, technique. And I think that... Uh, uh, the advantage in the, of, uh, of this per technique from uh, my personal point of view is particularly on what is uh, following after. I don't know if we can move to the next, uh, maybe. Okay, the bladder cuff. Why should we remove the, the bladder cuff? Be because in fact, uh, there is a study from the SEER database where 32% of the, the patient did not have the bladder cuff removed. And this study, retrospective, did not show uh, an advantage um, um, a disadvantage in cancer-specific survival. On the contrary, another study show actually uh, the opposite, and particularly the failure to remove the bladder cuff was associated with a higher risk of intravesical uh, recurrence. So 
the recommendation is that we should always do remove the bladder cuff. Many autos that do a minimal invasive, not robotic, the robotic surgeons, uh, they do the, the bladder cuff uh, robotically all, all the times because it's easier, it's, uh, it's much easier. But if you do laparoscopic, many laparoscopic surgeons do the bladder cuff uh, either uh, extravesical or intravesical. And uh, there are being also, because you know, you can use the same, uh, the same uh, open uh, assets that, uh, through which you will remove the, the sample. But there is also an endoscopic technique, and the study has compared the endoscopic, uh, extravesical, intravesical uh, modes of removing the blood cap. And what was found in this study that, uh, is that the endoscopic technique has the highest risk of intravesical recurrence. So it probably should not uh, be used as a uh, as a technique. Again, this study uh, compared uh, a pure laparoscopic nephroureterectomy with uh, a laparoscopic nephroureterectomy and the open blood cap. And it's quite worrisome if we look at the, the result. It's a case serious, but obviously we cannot ignore also this uh, case serious. But because in this study, what was, uh, was, uh, was found is that the patients at a higher risk of uh, unusual metastatic sites. And this is what may happen if you do, for instance, an intraperitoneal technique, because all the cases that uh, had the laparoscopic uh, blood cuff uh, had this done uh, uh, intra with an intraperitoneal approach. So I think that probably this could be the, the reason why, if we can uh, have the, the video, this could, could be the, the, the reason uh, why there is this uh, a risk that has been also shown in the first meta-analysis where, where it was found that if you do a laparoscopic bladder cuff, you have a higher risk of bladder cancer. Here I'm showing you, we move the optic to work down and uh, you see that uh, we can isolate the, the, the ureter. And uh, what I think is the advantage of this technique is that when we do the bladder cuff, you have a spillage of urine, and uh, I cannot uh, honestly understand why it should not uh, be possible to have a seeding of the tumor. But if you are in the extraperitoneal space, then you, you can uh, wash out easily what you cannot do probably when uh, you are using a transperitoneal technique. I think that uh, probably... So, conclusion, minimal invasive surgery is oncologically safe uh, for most nephroureterectomy. Obviously, we have to be careful when uh, we have a local advanced disease. We have also to be careful about unusual metastatic sites, and this is the same for robotic and uh, minimal invasive uh, uh, cystectomy. My question is, is the future of nephroureterectomy robotic? I come from a robotic uh, center, and I personally cannot really see the advantages of doing a robotic uh, nephroureterectomy. Probably if you have an unrestricted access to this uh, uh, technique, you can do that, uh, that but it's more uh, cumbersome. And I still have the problem, the concerns of the transperitoneal approach. The pure extraperitoneal extra laparoscopic uh, technique, we are just publishing a, a case uh, series and we are collecting all the cases uh, prospectively, can respect all the oncological outcomes and may overcome this uh, actually risk that we have seen in some cases series of, uh, of uh, risk of metastatic spread. Thank you very much for your attention. Fantastic, thank you so much. Everybody who knows Paolo he knows he's really a virtuoso in the OR and uh, laparoscopic as well as robotic as well as open. And uh, I think this is pretty impressive, the retroperitoneal. We always, I'm always a little bit stressed uh, thinking about it if you have a complication or problem, how you're gonna fix it until you turn around to the patient or get into position, but it's possible, right? Um, the lymphadenectomy has been always the, the, the issue. We had a publication of Marco Moschini showing that the more people are doing laparoscopic, which almost all nephroeterectomies are done probably laparoscopic nowadays, the least the number of lymphadenectomies are done, but you said this, is, this doesn't have to be like that, right? It doesn't have to be. Questions? Any questions? Wolfgang, please. Have one.
Thank you for this talk. Do you have any, any hint uh, for a distally invasive uh, ureter tumor which invades the bladder? Not to have any tumor spillage when you are uh, removing the, the, the bladder calf? Yes, I, I well, you know, uh, I, I anticipated that this specific technique maybe is the, you, you do not have to necessarily to, to apply to all patients. And uh, so I think that uh, this particular case that you obviously know from the CT and also because you do also cystoscopy before you do this, uh, this procedure, I think is probably the one that uh, I would not uh, approach uh, uh, with, uh, with this uh, technique because uh, you have to, to do a, a wide uh, bladder cuff. But at the same time, I, I would be very, very reluctant to approach this case uh, with an uh, intraperitoneal uh, robotic approach because uh, you, you, in the end you have a spillage of, uh, of, uh, of the tumor. Absolutely. And sometimes you have also not to, to forget that uh, we see the bladder that is clean, but uh, sometimes we have carcinoma in situ and uh, we open the bladder and uh, we have cells uh, coming out. So the, the reason of this technique is, uh, is just because uh, I think ureterial cancer, we have to consider ureterial cancer aggressive, and when we do nephroureterectomy, we, by definition, we are treating an high-grade uh, disease. And so, but yes, the, the case you're mentioning, I would probably not do with this, uh, Thank this you. technique. Probably it's a case for uh, this ureterectomy reimplant and uh, some of my colleagues have been, you know, for the carcinoma in situ and so on, giving the mitomycin during the surgery, right? And, and uh, or initially, or making sure the bladder is as clean as possible, but the spillage is always a high risk. Thank you so much. Let's Thank take you. a picture for you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Thank Paolo. You Thank you so much for coming. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to have you here. Um, Next speaker is Altuk Tunchul. Uh, Altuk and I have been friends since 2006, I think, right? Uh, when he was at UT Southwestern with Karim Ben Salah. And uh, Altuk uh, came for a fellowship in uh, laparoscopy with Jeffrey Cadedo and became the god of laparoscopy and really an incredibly skilled and knowledgeable surgeon. Uh, uh, the number, the sheer number of cases he has done in his career is incredible. He's uh, the chair now in, in Ankara, where he leads a big, uh, he's part of a, a really huge department uh, with 300 inpatient beds, and he leads one of the four groups there. He's been very active on many areas, so I'm very proud to have you here with us. Thank you so much, Altuk. Dear distinguished colleagues, thank you. I am very happy to be uh, here. I would like to thank the organizing committee, especially Professor Shariat. Uh, I am going to brief information about the fluorescent guided laparoscopic partial adrenectomy in light of our experience and literature results. Uh, laparoscopic partial adrenectomy uh, was first uh, described by Dr. Walz uh, in 1996 in selected cases. And uh, the aim of this operation to preserve adrenocortical function, avoid lifelong straight replacement therapy and its side effect, and avoid the risk of uh, possible risk of uh, postoperative adrenal failure. Uh, the indications are the bilateral uh, tumors or patients with uh, especially uh, hereditary uh, cancer disease uh, such as von Nippel Lindau syndrome. Unilateral hormonoactive or non-functioning tumors with less than four centimeter in uh, diameter located laterally uh, or anteriorly in order to preserve the adrenal vein uh, represent an indication for partial resection. The indication, uh, the indicated safety margins are between three to five millimeter. It is very similar to uh, open or uh, laparoscopic partial nephrectomy. And it is crucial that uh, in malignant adrenal tumors, the partial nephrectomy is not an uh, surgical uh, option. Uh, most centers uh, perform this operation via transperitoneal approach uh, with standard laparoscopic adrenectomy uh, trocar placement. Uh, 
At the beginning of the uh, laparoscopic partial adrenectomy era, uh, some uh, authors uh, use a perioperative ultrasound for identification of the uh, resection line. Uh, 20 years ago, Dr. Padler uh, from the United States uh, published uh, their experience uh, about the perioperative ultrasound in uh, laparoscopic partial adrenectomy. In this paper, uh, eight patients underwent unilateral, three patients uh, underwent bilateral uh, laparoscopic partial adrenectomy, and according to our results, there were no complications due to intraoperative ultrasound, no conversions uh, to open surgery. In the short-term uh, follow-up period, uh, three months, no recurrence have been uh, noted, and no adrenal insufficiency were reported. But uh, the current literature state that uh, ultrasound requires interruption of dissection for scanning, and it may not possible to achieve a proper contact plane between the adrenal tissue and probe. So uh, this uh, kind of limitations cannot apply to uh, fluorescent uh, imaging uh, technology uh, with uh, endocyanin green. As you know, the endocyanin green uh, is an amphibolic tricarbocyanin uh, material uh, exhibits uh, fluorescence in uh, near infrared uh, fluorescent imaging. And according to international literature, uh, a few uh, paper used uh, this material uh, during pure laparoscopic uh, partial uh, adrenalectomy uh, for identification, uh, the, uh, for identification, the resection line, tumor identification, and vascular uh, supply. Uh, upland, uh, ad, uh, vascular supply. Uh, what is the tips and tricks? Uh, we have some uh, brief tricks uh, in this operation. The adrenal vein preservation is very uh, crucial in this operation because uh, this preservation ensures a functional stamp provides better hemostasis due to adequate drainage, avoid a congestion of the gland. It is very crucial for uh, provide the vitality of the uh, adrenal gland. Also, uh, during this operation, we can use a vessel uh, sealing device uh, for the resection. Also, uh, in some cases, uh, we can use a polymer uh, ligating clip uh, for uh, preventing bleeding upon uh, surgery's decision. The patient uh, position is very similar to uh, total adrenectomy. And the trocar placement also uh, very similar. In the right side, we usually use a fourth trocar. The fourth trocar uh, could be used in for uh, liver retraction. Uh, generally, in the left side, uh, we usually uh, complete this operation with using uh, three trocars. Uh, uh, I have a short presentation, video presentation. The patient uh, has a 30 year old uh, medical doctor. He suffered from uh, malign hypertensive uh, attacks and syncopes. Uh, he had a one centimeter in diameter in left uh, adrenal mass. Uh, as you can see, uh, this is kidney. Uh, we can uh, identify the adrenal gland and adrenal mass. Now, I am dissecting the adrenal gland uh, uh, from, the, uh, from the upper pole of the kidney. Uh, in this operation, we usually remove the uh, adrenal uh, fat tissue. So, we gave a, a ICG material. Approximately 30 or 45 minutes later, you can see here the kidney and the adrenal could be uh, seen. Also, we always uh, see the adrenal vein for uh, preserving. Uh, as you can see here, the adrenal mass uh, was seen as hypofluorescent. The resection line uh, is very clear. So I am uh, preserving the adrenal vein. Then I am uh, starting the uh, resection with using vessel uh, sealing device. Uh, I usually use a ligature. Then uh, I am going to complete the uh, resection. I usually use a five millimeter vessel sealing device here. Then uh, I am going to uh, check the vitality of the remnant uh, adrenal tissue. As you can see here, the remnant uh, adrenal tissue is uh, seen uh, very uh, good. Uh, I don't use uh, a drain, 
I always uh, apply the hemostatic agent at the end of the operation. Then uh, I am going to remove the uh, specimen. The pathology was adrenal medullar hyperplasia. This is the unique uh, case. We are going to, uh, it is uh, accepted uh, by the international uh, journal. We are going to publish this case uh, in the literature. The complications uh, are uh, similar with uh, total adrenectomy. Uh, we can see the peri or postoperative bleeding, uh, some organ injuries, uh, vessel injuries, adrenal vein injuries, and uh, postoperative uh, adrenal failure. In the international literature, we first published uh, a paper on ICG usage uh, in a laparoscopic partial adrenectomy three years ago. Uh, we had uh, eight patients. Seven patients underwent uh, unilateral, one patient uh, underwent uh, bilateral uh, laparoscopic, uh, fluorescent assisted laparoscopic partial adrenectomy. As you can see here, the patient had aldosteronoma, angiomilipoma, Cushing syndrome, adrenal cyst, and macronodular adenoma. And uh, in patients with uh, Cohn syndrome, Cushing syndrome, and adrenal cyst, the uh, uh, the adrenal mass uh, was seen as uh, hypofluorescent when compared to the uh, normal adrenal tissue. In phacromostoma and angiomelipoma patients, the uh, mass uh, is seen as isofluorescent and hyperfluorescent uh, relative to the uh, normal adrenal tissue and our uh, median follow-up was uh, 10 months and uh, no patients uh, required post-operative replacement therapy and we, we did not uh, find a biochemical or clinical recurrence after the post-operative uh, follow-up uh, period. Uh, two years ago, uh, Dr. Maximilian Lehmberger uh, published their uh, experience uh, about this issue. Uh, three patients uh, underwent a bilateral uh, fluorescent assisted laparoscopic partial adrenectomy due to bilateral uh, phacromostoma, and uh, they found that uh, the phacromostoma uh, was seen as hypofluorescent, and the Cushing adenoma was seen as isofluorescent uh, pattern. And uh, when they evaluate uh, the postoperative uh, follow up, uh, one patient uh, get a complete adrenal insufficiency, uh, one patient had partial adrenal failure, and the other one uh, was uh, normal. Uh, this is the last slide. Uh, what uh, are the guidelines said about the laparoscopic partial adrenectomy? Most of the international important uh, guidelines such as American gastrointestinal endoscopic surgeons and European endocrinology and metabolism uh, guidelines say uh, recommend that a laparoscopic partial adrenectomy, a standard or uh, fluorescent guided, uh, recommend only uh, bilateral uh, phacromostoma patients due to uh, hereditary uh, cancer. Only uh, Korean Endocrinology uh, Society recommends uh, this uh, operation in patients with bilateral phacromostoma and sporadic non-functional or functional uh, tumors with less than uh, four centimeter in diameter. I believe that in near future, uh, the indication uh, will be uh, expanded, and uh, especially the sporadic uh, messes uh, are going to place in the important guidelines. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Please, questions. This is another frontier. Uh, Mesut is also very involved in our adrenal program with the endocrine surgeons together. This is another frontier in urology in general by understanding the functionality of this and also the technical approach, please. Thank you very much. I think a great presentation is also something we should focus as urologists also deal with adrenals. So thank you very much. I have, I have one question for you. You said at the beginning, um, we should not do a, a, a partial adrenalectomy in malignant tumors. I think it's only for ACC and not for pheochromocytoma, which is from the beginning also a malignant tumor. So if you have a bilateral pheochromocytoma and 
you are in the in the good chance to to do a, a sparing. I think there is actually no way to do not a partial, because otherwise a patient needs cortisone and everything. So I think we should really, as you said, we should go for it and, and do it and do a partial uh, mainly on one side. But what are your thoughts and your experience on that? Actually, I, want to I wanted to <coughs> indicate that uh, the uh, partial adrenectomy, uh, both open or laparoscopic, is contraindicated in patients with adrenocortical carcinoma. So we can uh, perform this operation, uh, the bilateral benign or malign uh, phacromostoma patients. This is the one way. So uh, the patients have, uh, has uh, two uh, bilateral tumors. So adrenocortical carcinoma is the problematic cancer, as you know. So I don't want to choose uh, this uh, technique in this kind of patients. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for coming. It is. Thank you so much, Altuk. It's a really pleasure to have you here, and uh, to to discuss. You know this really, uh, I think, innovative concept that you know many, very few urologists have heard about. So we come to uh, one of my favorite areas of uh, urology is metastatic ureter carcinoma, and nobody better, I think, in the whole world than Maria DeSantis to present on this and give us what has been the recent approaches and can we adapt personalized medicine to this disease that was often one size fits all with one drug. Today we have many options, but are we reaching the gear of personalized medicine? Thank you so much, Maria, for coming. Well, thank you very much, uh, Sharok, for your kind introduction. It's a great pleasure to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Um, ladies and gentlemen, a very good afternoon. My favorite topic is bladder cancer indeed, and it is not only Sharok's favorite topic. <laughs> All right, so my, uh, I was asked to talk about personalized therapy of advanced urothelial carcinoma. Is it, or is it reality? Well, let's see. These are my disclosures, and uh, my agenda is actually pretty short. I will give you a short introduction. I will uh, lead you into the hi history of precision oncology in urothelial cancer, and uh, then uh, we'll talk about the FGF, FGFR, and uh, inhibitors, and uh, have maybe a brief look beyond all that, and I will give you a short outlook in my summary. So the introduction is uh, what we already know. Uh, what is the standard treatment of advanced and metastatic urothelial cancer? It is platinum-based uh, uh, chemotherapy. In the first-line setting, we have been discussing uh, cisplatin eligibility and ineligibility for the last 10 years, and we have used cisplatin for the last 30 years. Um, we know that with cisplatin combination chemotherapy, the median OS is between 14 and 15 months, and uh, only about 15% of patients will achieve a kind of long-term remission uh, after uh, gemcitabine, cisplatin, or AMVAC uh, chemotherapy. And uh, this is a little bit different with carboplatin. Here, the OS is shorter, and um, actually no patients really achieve long-term remission. So the uh, picture changed uh, with the introduction of maintenance treatment, uh, so platinum-based chemotherapy followed by uh, immunotherapy maintenance with Avelumab changed the picture, and this is, has, been, uh, has become a new standard of care. The OS in the ITT population is shown here in the, um, in the curves. Uh, they are clearly separated, and uh, here we see uh, for the first time in 30 years an overall and over a survival benefit with the introduction of that maintenance uh, treatment in the first line setting of the patients. So this is an overview of the locally advanced and metastatic uh, space. First line setting, as just said, cisplatin eligible patients receive uh, gem cis or AMVAC, uh, or at least those stands AMVAC actually, cisplatin ineligible patients, uh, gem carbo, and platinum ineligible patients uh, stay with uh, Pembro or atezolizumab when they are PDL1 positive. The maintenance uh, treatment has changed the field and is the new standard of care after platinum treatment. Um, 
as long as the patients have derived a clinical benefit. Then second line treatment with immune checkpoint inhibitors and the FDA approved erdofitinib, the uh, FGFR, in FGFR alterated patients. In the third line setting, uh, we have the approval of enfotumab vedotin, the new standard of care in this space. Um, and the FDA also approved erdofitinib in the third line plus uh, setting. Uh, and um, as well as satituzumab, satituzumab govitecan, the other um, antibody drug conjugate. So this is kind of the worldwide uh, uh, standard of care. Now, uh, what about precision oncology? Are we getting there also in Europe? Is this a, a topic that we have to approach? So um, a little history. Um, more than 10 years back, uh, investigators of Sloan Kettering uh, uh, led a trial in advanced uh, urothelial cancer patients, and uh, this was an Everolimus uh, phase two trial, which turned out to be negative in unselected patients. The investigators there uh, saw one CR and one pathological remission in 45 patients through a clearly negative phase two trial. But they uh, were looking into that CR patient. They did a genome sequencing, uh, a whole genome sequencing in that patient, and also in the PR patient. Uh, because they were kind of surprised that this patient had a, a, a long-term remission, a complete response for uh, more than 36 months. So this has not uh, been seen before in uh, urothelial cancer. And they found out that uh, that patient had an NF2 and TSC1 mutation. Uh, so they looked in the PR patient and or the PR patient had also a TSC1 mutation. And none of the uh, progressing patients had any of those mutations. So this was the kind of birth of uh, uh, looking into genomic, uh, genomics of bladder cancer uh, coming from Sloan Kettering. Um, the conclusion of the authors, this was published in uh, 2010, I think, uh, um, uh, by, uh, by Gopa Ayer. Uh, the conclusion was Everolimus is active in uh, patients with uh, metastatic urothelial cancer harboring TSC1 mutations, and this was found in 6% uh, of the patients, and actually in our practice now it is much, much, much lower. So, um, Coming to, this was reverse uh, translation. C coming to forward translation, uh, this is what we usually do, coming from the lab to the clinic. Um, and uh, investigators uh, made a series of uh, genome sequencing in the patients and looked at what the spectrum of actionable or druggable genomic alterations is, because finding alt uh, genomic alterations in bladder cancer um, is, uh, well, this is a given. All the patients have uh, some sort of genomic alterations, but uh, does this have a clinical consequence? And yes, it could have. They found in 60% of patients with bladder cancer some sort of uh, actionable genomic alterations. Um, and alterations where we have drugs that have been approved and shown efficacy, at least in other uh, entities. So um, it makes sense to also look into bladder cancer and uh, make the trials uh, to see if uh, uh, those approved drugs might be also effective in bladder cancer. Now the most prominent uh, um, alteration in bladder cancer is FGF, FGFR. Uh, mutations and uh, um, for those FGFR inhibitors were developed, not only in bladder cancer. And as a matter of fact, uh, um, it goes back 20 years. In 1999, Capellan and colleagues already published the FGFR3 uh, alterations uh, showing uh, that uh, there are there are the drivers in uh, urothelial cancer. And here you can see the typical FGFR alterations. Uh, actually, there, there are four of them, uh, and uh, these are um, those where we actually uh, anticipate, where we know that they most likely are the drivers uh, for uh, that uh, disease setting, at least. And we see here mutations, we see fusions, we see amplifications. Um, uh, so this is uh, the spectrum uh, in those drugs. Um, uh, this is the spectrum in those uh, genes. So um, 
It took 20 years until the first approval um, of an FGFR inhibitor took place, so it took a very long time with many failures uh, to show that erdofitinib is effective. Uh, the FDA approved erdofitinib in April uh, 2019, and uh, this was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. So uh, the FGFR signaling pathway in urothelial cancer is shown here. We have five receptor tyrosine kinases that bind our FGF. This activates the downstream signaling. We have the typical cell proliferation, the differentiation, etc. And this regulation of the signaling can lead to oncogenesis, obviously. We find around 15 to 20 percent of patients harboring FGFR alterations in bladder cancer. Um, this is also associated with luminal papillary subtype. In upper tract patients, we find around 30 percent of uh, FGFR alterations, and uh, in these patients, uh, um, also less T cell infiltration uh, is uh, um, usually found. So the incidence of FGFR alterations is uh, extremely high in uh, bladder cancer compared to other cancers, compared to breast, endometrial, and the other cancers. Uh, so here, bladder cancer is kind of outstanding. You see here uh, the most prominent, the FGFR3 in green, but there are also FGFR2 and 1 alterations. And uh, you see the incidence of rearrangements, mutations, and amplification in the uh, different colored bars um, over there. What we have learned in the meantime, and not only in bladder cancer, but also in other cancers, is that not all alterations are drivers and not all alterations are really predictive of response. Uh, the orange parts of the bars show the partial responses, and these are found usually in those patients who have mutations and fusions, but not in those who just have amplifications. And uh, this is kind of... Uh, Information is important for our clinical practice, so just finding a kind of alterations is not enough. We actually need to uh, look closer and really identify those who are important um, uh, being a biomarker. Now looking into erdofitinib, the only approved FGFR inhibitor uh, in uh, bladder cancer, erdofitinib uh, as published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, this was based on a phase two trial, a non-controlled trial with uh, uh, 100 patients. And uh, the patients had to be pretreated with platinum and some of the patients also had immune checkpoint inhibitors uh, before being treated in that trial. The objective response rate was 40%. Um, and this is pretty high uh, when compared to old-fashioned chemotherapy in the second line or third line or even immunotherapy. Uh, duration of response, uh, uh, nearly six months, uh, PFS as well, 5.5 months, and the median over survival, 13.8 months, and of note, these are pretreated patients. So there are also other FGFR inhibitors uh, in uh, studies and all published data. Uh, Erdofitinib is the outstanding one with the 40% uh, uh, overall uh, an objective response rate. The others like infigratinib, rogaratinib, pemigatinib show lower response rates. Uh, of course, the cross-trial comparison is uh, not fair, but uh, actually we don't know if the others are less effective or if, if uh, this is due to patient selection because uh, the patients were selected uh, for different uh, mutations or different uh, fusions, and uh, for rogorotinib, for example, another methodology was used. Uh, they uh, um, looked into mRNA overexpression, and uh, only 11% of the patients in that trial had FGFR3 mutations. So these populations are not, uh, are not comparable. Duration of response, as shown here, is pretty in a swimmer plot, uh, pretty impressive. So not uh, as with, we know with chemotherapy, we just have a response and uh, uh, the next scan already sh uh, shows uh, the progression. Uh, FGFR inhibitor, erdofitinib, can induce also durable responses. 
uh, the effect does not come without side effects, and here is a list of the most common side effects, uh, hand foot syndrome, mucositis, stomatitis, hyperphosphatemia uh, is very typical, 70% of the patients uh, have hyperphosphatemia, nail changes can be very uh, bothersome for the patients, and um, uh, eye problems, central retinopathy, uh, conjunctivitis, tearing, these are the problems that patients are facing, and we have to deal with those, pa uh, with those side effects. Effect and uh, um, um, and treat the patients and take care of the patients to bring them through treatment to keep them on treatment. Uh, well, what is the situation in Europe? We are still waiting for the results of the TOR phase three trial, erdofitinib, with a compared to investigator choice treatment on the one hand for a PDL1 inhibitor and uh, uh, platinum. Um, uh, pretreated patients, and a cohort 2 erdofitinib versus pembrolizumab when it comes to second line. Um, so uh, the jury is still out here, and we hope for a positive results and approval also in Europe. There was uh, one trial with uh, rogaratinib uh, just published a few weeks ago in the uh, JCO by Cora Sternberg, the Ford one trial. Um, it was uh, actually stopped because of futility um, is, uh, as you see, response rate uh, 20 versus 19 percent uh, of rogaratinib versus uh, chemotherapy in patients that were pretreated with urothelial cancer. So this was the first uh, uh, trial with a comparator arm, and unfortunately it was negative, or yes, let, let's say it was negative. And uh, this uh, um, combination uh, or this uh, mon mo kind of monotherapy will not be pursued at, at the moment. Still, there are trials uh, um, open and ongoing. The combination with immunotherapy seems to be uh, very promising. And there is the NORS trial with erdofitinib cetralimab, the FOD2 trial, rogorotinib plus adhezolizumab, and the FIT205 trial, just to uh, name a few of them, with pemigatinib plus, plus pembrolizumab in uh, mainly first-line patients is platin unfit, so going earlier in the disease course. Um, so what is the outlook, precision oncology in urothelial cancer? And um, as a, because uh, I don't have uh, much time left, I just go to the conclusions. Precision medicine in bladder cancer actually has arrived. FGF, FGFR pathway is critical for the carcinogenesis in many tumors, including bladder cancer. The identification of patients that can receive a targeted therapy based on genetic abnormalities in FGFR is possible. Erdofitinib is effective, 40% objective response rate in previously treated patients, and also in fact uh, effective in those with visceral uh, metastasis, for example. The adverse event management is critical to keep the patients safe and on treatment. And uh, for this, I think the interdisciplinary management of uh, the patients uh, to treat the side effects jointly is really critical. Genetic testing in metastatic urothelial cancer will, will advance the field. This is my true belief. Uh, beyond FGFR alterations, there is uh, something ongoing. Um, believe me, I did not have the time to go into details. Um, DNA uh, repair deficiency biomarkers uh, to select patients for the trials with PARP inhibitors, for example, um, are, is ongoing. And uh, HRR mutation cons is consistent with a poor prognosis. So we need for those patients particularly novel treatment strategies because they will have an adverse outcome uh, if we are not able to target uh, the driver mutations. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, I'm really happy to be here and Merry Christmas to everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for a very important talk that uh, ushers the time of precision medicine in, in bladder cancer or urethral carcinoma. Wolfgang, please. Maria, thank you very much. FGFR is a big issue in the upper tract. Uh, do you think there will be some studies uh, specific for the upper tract uh, metastatic uh, carcinoma? Well, I don't think we need uh, separate trials for the upper tract because they are included in uh, the trials for metastatic disease. 
There has been uh, a trial for, uh, in particular, upper tract patients in the adjuvant setting, uh, the approved 302 trial. This had to be closed for lack of accrual. It was too difficult to accrue those patients, so it has just been closed, unfortunately. Also, maybe FGFR inhibitors are difficult to use in the adjuvant setting, as we already saw in renal cell carcinoma, because there is some toxicity. It's not so easy to do these trials. And um, selecting patients uh, for the trials is uh, a kind of challenge uh, with uh, genome sequencing and selecting them. So um, it, it, it was uh, difficult. And I think we have learned that there are challenges from prostate cancer already in geo-oncology. Um, I think we take what we have learned there to urothelial cancer to also do these trials successfully. Okay. And do you think that FGFR drugs are um, capable for combinations or is it difficult? No, uh, they are uh, very easy to combine with immunotherapy, for example. I think it's a challenge to combine them with chemotherapy because of toxicity. But with immunotherapy, I think it's pretty easy also with combination immunotherapy. Thank you. Just uh, two questions. Number one, why not approved in Europe and you have three years approval in the United States? What is missing? Is it just a phase two and it's not sufficient data and uh, the TOR study is ongoing? And uh, the, let's do that. And the second question would be, if we believe that muscle invasive bladder cancer already in 30% to 50% is already systemic, when should we do the genetic testing? and what is the future of this precision oncology? Well, as always, two uh, very important questions. The uh, first one, um, approval. Well, the EMA uh, has kind of principles uh, and uh, FD, uh, FDA is kind of more loose with giving uh, um, the accelerated approvals. Um, the EMA is waiting for the uh, randomized phase three trial and is not willing to base an approval on a phase two trial. Uh, so uh, this is the usual thing. Uh, it was the same with Infotromop Vidotin. We also had to wait for the phase three trial. So, um, and uh, it is kind of unfair for our patients, I think. I think for individual decisions, we should have those uh, uh, drugs in hand earlier. Um, but yes, uh, this we, we are complaining, but uh, maybe it's complaining at the, at, at, at the wrong uh, um, at the wrong address. Uh, maybe um, EMA uh, will be more prone to early approvals if there was uh, patient advocacy groups, but they are not so strong in bladder cancer, still not strong enough. So um, let's see how this is going to develop in the future. But uh, this is for the first uh, question. Um, the uh, second question um, was about the... Uh, well, if we believe these drugs, drugs really worked that yeah, well, it, why it, not earlier? earlier? When, would, when yeah. would you do the genetic testing? Yeah. Let's say it, it happens that it's, it's really working 40% with those alterations in late stages, and metastatic disease yeah. starts early in bladder cancer. So, uh, yes, I, I think it's... Uh, um, it would be useful to do the uh, testing as soon as the patient is metastatic because we know that uh, we don't cure the patients. Uh, so um, doing that uh, when, when the patient starts with uh, cisplatin is fine. Um, as a matter of fact, we would not use treatment um, in the first line setting until now. Uh, we will have to, need, uh, to wait for the uh, trials. Um, but earliest is second line setting, so it would be nice to have the results to know if the, there is an FGFR um, alteration or any other uh, alteration of interest before starting the second line treatment. And maybe in a neoadjuvant setting, in some upper tracts or so on, you think? Uh, well, uh, I just said uh, the uh, adjuvant trial with infigratinib was just closed because uh, the accrual was uh, too difficult. And uh, Yes, uh, I think it would be of interest uh, with the caveat that those drugs are pretty um, toxic and uh, it is a challenge for, the, I had some patients on the trial and my patients actually were also a bit struggling with uh, uh, FGFR inhibitor in the adjuvant setting. So it is, uh, uh, it is uh, not as easy, but uh, I think the combination with immunotherapy uh, might uh, be the, the way to go in the future to have kind of the, Double, 
double treatment in the beginning and maybe only half a year of FGFR inhibitor and then a full year of uh, adjuvant immunotherapy, maybe this would uh, make it easier for the patients. Thank you so much, Maria. As always, an absolutely wonderful oh, the picture. The picture. We're going to do the picture. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you very much. much. Thank you. So, talking about numbers and talking about complexity in personalized medicine, we're talking about kidney cancer today, right? It's a field not frequent tumor, as you think, frequent enough, but really has become very complex and a lot of advancement to have. And nobody better than Manuel Schmidinger to tell us, not only based on our incredible knowledge of biology, as well as uh, the, the science that is ongoing, but her incredible patient care, where she really has achieved tremendous advancements and progress for our patients. And uh, we we're very curious to listen what has happened over the last year, Manuela. Thank you, Sharok. It's a great pleasure to be here. And as you said, I'm going to take you on a journey on what happened in kidney cancer in 20 and 22. So um, let me start with the adjuvant setting, which has been very much on the focus in the last year, in fact, or in the last one and a half years. We have meanwhile seen at asco an update, a 30 months update of the trial, uh, pembrolizumab versus placebo in patients with intermediate high or high risk or after resection of oligometastasis. And you know this trial was initially already positive in terms of improvement, statistically significant improvement in terms of disease-free survival. Overall survival data are not mature, but the figures look interesting, let's say. And the 30 months update showed even better data with a hazard ratio now, a risk reduction of 42% uh, for uh, progression after uh, surgery. Also, the trial appear, or the, the drug appears to be quite safe. The discontinuation rate was only 20%, and the steroid use only less than 10%. And um, this may be different in real world. We have started using uh, pembrolizumab right away. It was, has been a, made available already earlier, as you know perfectly, uh, because of the, of the metastatic setting. So once the data were out, we started using pembrolizumab in exactly this risk population as described in the keynote trial. But what we noticed is that actually the toxicity is quite higher or the discontinuation rate is quite higher. So we noticed in the first 22 patients a discontinuation in 60% of patients due to immune-related adverse events. That's not a big deal, you may say. I mean, hepatitis, you can easily manage that with corticosteroids or some rush. But what is more difficult, in fact, is when a patient that has formerly been healthy develops insulin-dependent diabetes. That is an issue. Also, vitiligo could be an issue. It is, you may say it's just cosmetic, but it's, I wouldn't want to have it. So this is something uh, we noticed, and uh, this is something we need to be aware of. And I think uh, the study re results really are robust, the chance that this was, uh, that, or the, 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 the probability that this was just reached by chance, this result is one to 10,000, so it's very unlikely. The data are robust. Um, it's appropriate to talk to our patients about uh, this strategy, but of course we need to inform the patients uh, also regarding potential side effects. We might have uh, on our own our kind of risk group ranking, and we may uh, tell the patient with M1 NED uh, disease status, look, you are going to be among those who had the largest benefit, and maybe we are going to be a little bit less um, convincing in those patients who had intermediate high risk. And of course what we need is a better risk score. We need to get more data on, on, uh, on molecular risks, such as uh, presented at asco -GU. They used a um, uh, 22 gene EMT score. EMT stands for epithelial to mesenchymal transition, which means that the, that the tumor is uh, really going into a very bad biology, a sarcomatoid biology. And this risk score was clearly associated with a very high risk for metastasis. This is what we need for, for the future. 
What we also learned in uh, this year is that not everyone gets a piece of the cake. What do I mean by that? You may have seen that other checkpoint inhibitor strategies failed in the adjuvant setting. Nivolumab combined with ipilimumab versus um, a placebo, a negative trial with respect to disease-free survival, the same for atezolizumab versus placebo. And also uh, a, the PROSPA trial, a neoadjuvant slash adjuvant trial that was uh, compared versus observation uh, was negative in terms of improvement in disease-free survival. So the first thing you believe, of course, is that the patient population might have been completely different. That was not the case, not with respect to the size of the tumor, not with respect of the sarcomatoid component, and also not uh, with respect to the M1 NED patient population. But I think uh, there were some um, other factors that came in that, that need to be taken into account. First, for nivo ipi the realization of the treatment schedule was found to be difficult. 43% of patients discontinued for side effects. The PROSPA trial with one cycle, nivo-neo-adjuvant nivo, uh, nivo followed by adjuvant, um, many of the patients did not receive the planned treatment, no surgery and or no nivo after surgery. And finally, we also need to say not every agent is appropriate. From atezolizumab, we know already that it is not active in metastatic kidney cancer. This is one of the, uh, together with avelumab, the only that, were not, that have not shown a survival benefit. So this is probably just not an appropriate agent in kidney cancer. Let me now move on to the metastatic setting. This is an update of uh, trials conducted in first line. All these updates are from this year. The longest update is, from, is for nivo ipi followed by axitinib pembrolizumab, and then, and then we have the checkmate 9 er with nivo carbo and the CLEAR trial with lenvatinib pembrolizumab. And as you know, all of them were shown to be superior in terms of overall survival, progression-free survival, and response rate when compared to sunitinib. And of course, there is no comparison between those agents, and certainly no company would ever conduct such a comparative trial. What can we say by indirect comparison? Well, the risk reduction for this is similar, and this is a, a robust data. Objective response rates and complete response rates, here the combination of lenvatinib pembrolizumab was um, quite outstanding, let's say all of them produce nice responses, nice CR rates, but 71% uh, objective response rate and 17% complete response rate is unprecedented in kidney cancer. But what is also important, not only the incidence or the rate of complete response or response, it's also the duration of response. And interestingly here, it seems that the best, uh, com the best uh, strategy is nivo ipi So if nivo ipi works, it really works, and it works on the long term, and we believe that this is very much driven by ipilimumab. What is less good with ipilimumab is when you are under the pressure to shrink the tumor, maybe because you have a metastasis in a very difficult site close to the myelon, and you, you cannot risk any progression. I wouldn't choose nivo ipi in this context because the rate, uh, the risk reduction for primary progression is the lowest with this strategy. Here, we are better off with an IOTKI combination. But whenever comparing these strategies indirectly, please be aware, bear in mind, these were different trials, different patient populations. The lenvatinib pembrolizumab trial had more patients with favorable risk as well as less patient with a liver metastasis, and this may have accounted for uh, this nice data. So um, treatment selection in 2022 uh, is difficult, it's challenging. As I said, there are no comparative trials, but we do have data from subgroups that may help you in your uh, daily practice to choose the best individual treatment. And here I'm referring to the data from Nizak Tanir, uh, presented at ASCOGU, where he uh, looked at the subpopulation from the Checkmate 214 trial, nivo ipi and he concentrated on those patients who had sarcomatoid features. And the this is a five-year follow-up. And apart from the outstanding responses and complete responses, what you can see is that the 
that the median progression-free survival and overall survival in patients who had sarcomatoid tumors and pdl one expression has not been reached after five years. And I think this is a very strong message and really would prompt many of us to choose nivo uh, in such patients. And what I have seen in the clinic so far is that this is absolutely true. This is re reproducible in the clinics. Um, almost always, but almost always. Because what we face is that the, is the absence of biomarker which are really clinically relevant. And I'm going to show you, share with you the case of a patient from our department that really explains why we need these biomarkers. Patient underwent nephrectomy in 2001. I don't know the stage of the disease at the time uh, because he was not operated uh, at the university clinic. In August 22, he had uh, a metastasectomy, turned out to be an abdominal wall metastasis from his clear cell RCC, this time with extensive sarcomatoid features. Only two months later, he after metastasectomy, he progressed again, again soft tissue meds and lung metastasis, and he was classified intermediate risk. So when you see this patient, this is a more or less low volume disease patient, excellent performance status, sarcomatoid features, no signs of myeloid inflammation that may impair the response to checkpoint inhibitors. This is a clear cut choice for nivo -IP. Well, not a good choice in this patient, as you can see. This is this abdominal wall metastasis that increased in a very, very short time. We, were, we did the CT scan in December because we noticed that something is growing inside uh, the abdominal wall. And also in the lung, they counted him to have 96 lung metastases. So what's going on here? What is this response pattern? You know that different response patterns have been described with checkpoint inhibitors, and we needed to learn how to better um, judge on the CT scans, it's not always so easy to make a clear-cut um, decision on, on the stage, but I think here you would agree this looks really, <laughs> truly like progression, or, and it's, there is no doubt that this is not hyper-progressive, this is not pseudo-progression. Could be, however, hyper-progressive disease. What are the criteria for hyper-progressive disease? This has not been very well defined. We have some criteria that were proposed in the past, including more than 50% tumor burden increase or more than two new lesions in other organs. But most importantly, and if you have ever seen a patient with hyperprogressive disease, you would agree that these patients have really a massive deterioration in performance status. That was not the case for my patient. He was still in excellent performance status. He just noted that something was growing. He had no LDH. He had, and we need to consider that hyperprogressive disease is actually rare in kidney cancer. It's much more common in lung cancer and melanoma. So I think it's probably a primary resistance. And now our approaches can combinations overcome innate acquired resistance or even hyperprogressive disease. And as you know, we do this already. We combine agents. We do dual checkpoint inhibition. We combine checkpoint inhibitors with tyrosine kinase inhibitors. But of course, there are many other immune escape mechanisms that we uh, may need to target. And currently, we're just targeting a snapshot of this whole system that can lead to uh, escape. And this is where the new first-line strategies come into the game. Maybe it's better to really hit very hard in the first fight, as long as you don't kill, of course, the whole system. And in context of hitting hard uh, uh, comes the triplet trial, the first triplet trial into my mind, which is the COSMIC 313 trial, a trial that looked at the combination of nivolumab, ipilimumab, cabozantinib versus nivolumab, ipilimumab. And why is this a smart combination? First, because you know VEGF, TKIs have some strong immunomodulatory effects. Second, upregulated AXL is a target of cabozantinib and is involved in PD-1 uh, resistance. The trial was a positive trial when it comes to the 
uh, primary endpoint progression-free survival. However, you would agree the response rate of 43% and 3% complete responses were really disappointing. You may say, well, 65% of patients did not undergo prior nephrectomy. This is Carmina coming more and more into clinical reality. However, this is also very much driven probably by toxicity. The treatment is continuation. 45% of patients and also grade five toxicities were reported. So I believe that hitting heart might be good, but not with this triplet. It's not an option for the majority of patients and we really need biomarkers. And we do have more and more biomarkers, not enough, not really arrived yet in the clinics, but there is research going on and getting um, eventually into the clinics, increasing the benefit by, uh, from the treatment by knowing how to uh, modify uh, the microbiome of the patient. We have seen the first randomized trial on, uh, on a bifidogenic um, live bacterial product that was used in a randomized trial with nevo EP patients. And in this small trial really clearly showed a benefit in terms of progression-free survival and response rate. Also, we have seen this year the final data from the Bionic trial, a trial that sought to identify which patient needs uh, an immune checkpoint inhibitor, single agent, dual immune checkpoint inhibition, and are there patients who just need a TKI? And this is what the trial could demonstrate. And finally, intratumor heterogeneity is something that we need to consider when making a treatment choice. I'm addressing here the patients with pancreatic metastasis. And we have uh, seen the data this year, finally molec on a molecular level, that patients with pancreatic metastasis significantly more often express polybromo-1 mutations. That means they are non or, or less immunogenic and have poor response to checkpoint inhibitors alone. My last topic is new compounds in, in, or new strategies in non-clear cell RCC and also what's going on in orphan diseases. The first combination I'd like to mention is uh, in a trial, uh, is a phase two trial on nivolumab plus cabozantinib in a patient population with mixed uh, non-clear cell histology. Cohort one was any non-clear cell histology except chromophobe, and cohort two was the chromophobe, from, uh, which we know that's not really a good candidate for uh, checkpoint inhibition. And as you can see, the data are quite interesting. 48% response rate is a good number for, um, for non-clear cell histologies. Another com a combination that was found to be quite efficacious is lenvatinib combined with pembrolizumab. Again, here, response rates of all, almost 48% and the median duration of response not reached. So there is something going on also in non-clear cell histologies what is very important, and I think we may not always look here for phase three trials. It's difficult to conduct phase three trials in non-clear cell. And finally, it has been the year of success in orphan diseases. You, we have seen the update from the LightSpark 004 trial. This is a trial on bilzutifan, a HIF2 alpha inhibitor in patients with von hippel lindau disease. It was a small study, a phase two trial, 36 months update. In terms of response to the kidney tumors, that was 64%, even with complete responses. But you need to be aware that it's not the only area where these patients suffer from. Patients had excellent responses also in CNS hemangioblastomas, in neuroendocrine uh, tumors of the pancreas, and in ret retinal hemangioblastomas. This is probably the most important figure from the whole, to, to highlight the importance of this, of this compound. In the gray zone, you can see the number of surgeries that patients required before being treated with balzutifan. And I'd like to remind you, these are patients that from childhood until their death from kidney cancer undergo, one patient can undergo up to 30 or 40 surgeries to remove uh, hemangioblastomas, etc. And on the right side, we can see when the number of surgeries after they had started on a treatment with bezotifan. And because it's a good compound, it's now also being used in trials uh, in combination 
with uh, cabozantinib. This is the Lightspark 003 trial. So it's investigated in first line in, in multiple treatment lines in spontaneous kidney cancer with good outcome, 57% uh, responses, very good duration of response, long follow-up, median follow-up of 14 months, and the drug is also very well tolerated. No patients needed to discontinue because of side effects. So my conclusions, adjuvant treatment with pembrolizumab is appropriate, the data are robust, but toxicity may be higher than we had expected. We need to select the right patient, we need to inform the patient about adverse events, and we need new scores. Other adjuvant trials had failed. Trial designs, toxicity, realization of the treatment plan, wrong drug choice may account for this. Updates from first-line treatment strategies confirm the efficacy of these agents uh, after longer follow-up. Treatment selection remains challenging. Real-world outcomes demonstrate the urgent need of biomarkers. Triplets, although the first trial is a positive trial, the results were disappointing, highlighting again the importance of patient select selection. Promising biomarker research is ongoing, but we need urgently to translate the findings into clinical practice. And I think major steps were fo made forward in patients with non-clear cell histologies and with rare syndromes such as the Van Hippel lindau syndrome. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Really an incredible year. And uh, each year in kidney cancer seems really a lot of incredible year. Maria, we need to do each time I'm thinking better in bladder cancer, right? A lot of things are happening. Questions, please. No questions. I think the, the adjuvant question is the one that the urologist is asking more commonly, and as you're putting it, probably real-life data will show that it's not as, as well-tolerated as in a trial was selected and, and so on. So I think if there are no questions, we want to thank you. Uh, take a very fast picture, and um, we have to do the, the, the picture, and very fast. She works with us, but she still gets something. <laughs> Thank, you so Thank you so much. Um, listen, uh, we are really behind schedule, so I would ask you to really take only a 10-minute break. I know everybody wants to go out and not come back, or not, I'm joking, but to take a 30-minute break, it's not, it's not possible. Please, 10 minutes. Let's meet here at 32. We have three wonderful talks that are still coming. Really, I promise you, you're going to love them. You're going to be excited. Thank you very much.
Please, please, let's continue. We are in the final stretch. The finest comes last. Ganesh, you're gonna part, you're part of the dessert. <laughs> Peter, Ganesh, you're the dessert, you know? We had our entree, our main dish. So, the last session, the last session is going to be dedicated to prostate cancer specifically. We had already with the testosterone some touches on prostate cancer. Our main mission was to not have too much prostate cancer, uh, and, and, uh, but we still cannot leave prostate cancer out because it's such an important part of our daily management. So the first speaker is a very close friend. Uh, Peter is the chairman in, in, um, at Semmelweis University in Hungary. Uh, Semmelweis University and Medical University of Vienna have been friends, brothers. His former boss and my former boss have been best friends. We continue that tradition. We work closer together. Uh, he has a position as adjunct professor at our university. I work at his university and we have a close network of collaborations we, we, which we're expanding continuously. Thank you so much for coming. So thank you very much. This is really a very, very great honor and also a privilege to be invited so that uh, unfortunately Manuel Schmidinger is not here who just recently highlighted the importance of uh, biomarkers. Be, uh, I, I couldn't agree more. So this presentation, which is about the prediction of therapy response in metastatic castration uh, resistant uh, prostate cancer, this uh, talk is just, uh, I would like to present the successful cooperation between our universities as also between our departments. So in the last years, increasing number of new uh, drugs are uh, registered for treating metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer. So in addition to uh, uh, docetaxel, more and more drugs are available to treat this kind uh, of problem with different mechanism. Unfortunately, with all of these drugs and all of these mechanisms, there is seen some resistance. Unfortunately, it cannot be prevented. Therefore, it is an important somehow to find a way how we can predict uh, this resistance. So therefore, the aim of our study, so therefore the aim of uh, uh, our basic research was to find these uh, prognostic factors which could predict, uh, predict not only the success of uh, efficacy of these drugs, but also uh, as well as uh, to find the resistance. So the clinical, the histological, and also the molecular heterogeneity of the prostate cancer is well known. So therefore, there is a wish and there is a hope that in the molecular uh, level, we can find these predictive factors. So therefore, we conducted a, a proteomic uh, study to identify uh, the potential predictive serum biomarkers as well as the resistant mechanisms uh, against these uh, most frequently used uh, drugs. So therefore, we used uh, prostate cancer uh, cell line culture and then if whenever the uh, available cell lines, prostate cancer cell lines are treated with these drugs, with these treatments, uh, they're gonna be, uh, uh, they, uh, so the, the, the prostate cancer cells uh, will be treated. However, if there is a decreased uh, concentration of these drugs are given, so then we, can, we will be able to distinguish between the sensitive and the resistant cells. Whenever you repeat these mechanisms, this procedure, and uh, just increase the level of uh, these drugs, so the concentration of these drugs, by the end of the day, up to six to 12 months, you're gonna be able to uh, develop these cell lines, and in the end of the day, you're gonna have the sensitive and uh, uh, resistant cell lines. Then with these cell lines, uh, we are able to uh, perform a proteomic analysis, so, and then it's proteomic analysis, if uh, this is a comparative one, so we can, we will be able to uh, isolate or identify uh, those uh, proteins who might uh, play an important role for prediction of prostate cancer. 
So we, whenever these uh, proteins were, uh, uh, are uh, pointed, both in the sensitive and also uh, the resistant cell lines, because the number of these are quite high, so therefore uh, bioinformatic proteomic evolution has to be performed. We follow different kind of uh, methods. This is the, we use the Volcano and the Venn diagrams, and we also use the data banks. Whenever we were identified the most, uh, 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 be, the, the best and the, the, the uh, best biomarkers, then with the collected samples, the serum samples, we were able to uh, find, we were able to uh, perform the analysis and then we, we are able to uh, compare the uh, proteomic uh, result with uh, the survival and long-term data. So this is just how these cell lines look like after the microscope, and if you can, you can compare, and what we had, we had two uh, docetax cell sensitive and resistant cell lines, and we had three for abitron and enzalutomy cell lines, both in uh, the sensitive and also in the resistant matters. Here we are. So these are the differently expressed proteins between the docetax cell, sensitive versus the docetax cell resistant cell lines. You can see this uh, Volcano uh, plot diagrams, and on the X axis, uh, it shows the fault change, and on the Y axis, it shows the significance. So altogether, in the, in the right side of the crater, here, above these dash lines, it shows the protons, which shows a different, uh, a di different, different uh, qu quantitatively uh, different uh, value uh, between these uh, sensitive and resistant cell lines. As you can see, we were able to identify 177 uh, of these proteins. In the, this is the next one. This is the differently expressed proteins between abitron sensitive and resistant cell lines. And this is the same, so the Volcano uh, plot diagrams, we were able to uh, identify 68 significantly upregulated proteins in the abitron resistant cells. <coughs> and this is last but not least for the enzalutamide. And then uh, this is again the plot diagrams. Uh, altogether, there are 278 significantly upregulated proteins, uh, which might be a potential predictive uh, serum markers uh, for uh, metastatic castrate resistant uh, prostate cancer. So, using this technique, we will be able to identify altogether five, more than 500 significantly upregulated proteins in docesactyl abiraterone and enzotomid resistant cells. So then somehow we had to filter because this is impossible to perform all kind of, uh, all uh, examination in so many significantly upregulated proteins. So we used different methods to find the most promising one. Uh, the first, it was the functional scores. We used the fault change, as you might remember on the Volcano uh, diagram so that the fold, where the fold was higher, the molecular functions we are looking at. We also looked at the interactions with other proteins, and of course, it was very, very important to find out those who have available ELISA kits and uh, also pharmacological inhibitors. Next, the next, uh, second uh, filter, we identified the secreted proteins by database search. We used seven database search, and we were looking whether others who did something similar both in the research and also in the clinical studies, what did they find? <laughs> Last but not least, we, did, uh, we completed this filter in the comparative analysis of published, published proteomic transcriptome uh, data sets for docetaxel, abitron, and enzalutamide. As, as you can see, we were able to, uh, to find uh, and, uh, nine of these proteins. So altogether, that having these most promising proteins which were upregulated uh, significantly uh, in, uh, in the uh, resistance cell lines, were then proteomically measured, analyzed, and uh, these data were then uh, compared with uh, 
the survival and also long-term uh, data. These are the serum analysis, these are the result the, uh, clinical from, uh, of the clinical samples which were coming uh, from Vienna University and also the Semmelweis University. <coughs> and it shows the proteins is baseline samples and this shows the uh, significant difference. And in uh, docetaxel-treated patients, we were able to uh, identify two of these, the CD44 and the NAMPT. Uh, these might be a proteins which might help us predict uh, the resistance uh, between uh, resistance against these drugs uh, of these patients. Next, for enzymatomic treated patients, we were able to uh, quantitatively uh, find uh, that uh, quantitatively enough secretion of these proteins for five, and among these five proteins, there uh, only one, the L outcome, uh, showed a significant uh, correlation with survival data and also with uh, long-term follow-up. Last but not least, for abiraterone, so as you can see, there were four uh, uh, proteins detected, and uh, two of those showed significant uh, correlation between the clinical data. So whenever we had all this data, so that we can, uh, we can say so that altogether we have uh, four, if you compared these promising proteins with the clinical data, there are these four uh, proteins which might be used in the, in the future as uh, potential predictive uh, serum biomarkers uh, against, and, and also uh, uh, would be able to show the resistance uh, with metastatic castration resistant uh, prostate cancer treated with uh, the new line uh, therapies. So these are, uh, from, from the literature, there are also other DNA markers in prostate cancer which can be used uh, uh, for uh, the PARP inhibitor, the BRCA1, and two, of course, it's, it's very well known, and there are many, many uh, papers in the literature. The P10 uh, against the hepatocyte tip plus abiratron and pembrolizumab uh, has four potential uh, predictive biomarkers. So to be very honest with you, so these, uh, the research of biomarkers, it sounds something great. So it allows us uh, clinicians as having more and more opportunities to treat these poor guys with different kind of available treatments. However, unfortunately, I have something a very bad feeling that pharmaceutical companies are not so much interested, was not as much interested uh, to find and, and to uh, find these biomarkers because of course, from business point of view, that would be better to sell uh, uh, the drugs for everyone. So this is that there is a running study uh, for uh, with PARP inhibitor as a combination therapy. And then this is the aim is to something to achieve a, a promising data that uh, uh, probably a combination therapy could be given with ARTA, with PARP inhibitor for everyone, not only for the selected patients. Anyhow, I think just from clinical point of view, being a urologist and also uro-oncologist, I think the most important for all of us to find the best individualized therapy for all of our patients. So this is, there is a pilot clinical uh, studies running, fortunately in Hungary, uh, this kind of uh, uh, panel sequencing is already reimbursed in the Semmelweis University. So uh, the future is to try to find uh, these uh, and try, uh, try to also measure uh, these uh, promising biomarkers and also uh, to add the information uh, from this panel sequencing. So I would like to say many, many thanks for this uh, collaboration. So I would like to highlight the importance of the medical, uh, medical University of Vienna. So we have been working together for a long period of time. There's a connection uh, between us, not ourselves, but also Tibor Sarvas, who is a scientist, uh, used to work in, in medical university and now working in uh, our university. And uh, these are unfortunately, uh, uh, these, these are just a uh, few photos uh, from the past. The first one on the left side, so this, is, uh, this one is for, from 2012. This is a farewell party whenever 
my predecessor, Professor Romich, a very close friend of Professor Marberger. Uh, just, uh, uh, I'm just overtaking the uh, chairmanship uh, from him, and you can see he's there with his very, very closest friends. There are other uh, photos from, most likely, from the Central European Cooperation. Then I'm very honored to be uh, this photo together with uh, Professor uh, Marberger and, and three of us also in Vienna. And this is something very recent, and we are much, much more than honored and privileged that uh, our university honored uh, Professor Shariat with the doctoris honoris uh, causa, and there are uh, there is the rector and also the dean of the university, unfortunately, during the COVID era. And then the last but not least, absolutely just front of the paintings of our uh, Semmelweis Signas, uh, and together with Professor Shariat and his beloved mother. So I would like to say many, many thanks again for the invitation. Thank you very much. It was a very touching, fantastic talk and a very touching meeting when it was, uh, we are close friends, so you can see that. Um, questions to Peter. Precision medicine. Is it doable? Should it be homemade? Because now you So myself, so I'm really very, very sorry. I'm, I'm not so much deeply involved in this lab work. So that, therefore, but I would like to highlight the importance of the cooperation and, and uh, between the successful cooperation between us. I think so this is definitely the future so that just having more and more opportunities to treat these patients, I think that is the most important to find the best one. And the combination therapy, you know that this is good for someone who gives, who sells, but not uh, who's gonna receive it. Yeah, this, I think it's a good, it's a good message because uh, as uh, uh, Bertrand Tombal told us yesterday, Company sells drug, not treatment. I, I, I wrote all his quotes down, and it's, it's true, and, and, and it's a message that we as investigators need to be involved, not only in trial designs and in drug development, but also in understanding and driving the field forward to what our patients need, and not only uh, as working as partners with the industry, but not only for the industry. Thank you so much, Peter. Thank it was a wonderful much. presentation. Tonight you're going to meet also uh, Peter's wife, uh, you're going to see why he's so successful and such a, a, a tremendous man. So the next speaker is also a very, very, very close friend of mine. We've been doing research together starting on bladder cancer, but I knew him already before that, it, uh, the BCRC, and uh, uh, we've been very closely working together, being friends, and he's been adjunct professor for many, many years, has come to every single of our events, has given so many journal clubs, and then the most exciting, our residents wait for the years, uh, uh, and honestly, um, um, the only man who got me crying at a meeting. So uh, on, on the way he communicates, not only from the content, also from the bottom of his heart, is very special. Ganesh is a genius. He's the chairman at uh, Michigan. Please, uh, he's uh, worked on many areas from basic research, received most of the grants you can receive in the United States, and leads now the biggest uh, um, oncology program outside of a cancer center in the United States, and has been very successful. Thank you for coming, Ganesh, again. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Sherlock. It's really a pleasure for me to be here today. I want to thank Sharuk, I want to thank Harun and the uh, Medical University Department of Urology for giving me this opportunity to once again be here today at the Michael Marburger meeting. It's really, uh, really a pleasure for me to highlight every year, not only spend time with all of you, but with the residents um, who are also part of this esteemed department. I think I made uh, Sharuk cry because, you know, I was just telling too many jokes. He couldn't, couldn't tolerate it anymore. Um, I have really no uh, relevant uh, financial disclosures. Well, uh, I think as many of you know, um, partial therapy or focal therapy for prostate cancer is far from a novel concept. In fact, over 100 years ago, Hugh Hampton Young at Johns Hopkins first described the possibility of treating prostate cancer in its localized fashion. Um, and this is a, a, an excerpt from the Southern Medical Journal of where he described, uh, at that time, uh, introduced the concept of partial prostatectomy, whether in fact it could be possible or not. 
And perhaps not surprisingly, uh, 30 years ago, Professor Marburger was on the uh, forefront of leading, era, uh, leading discovery and leading science in the areas of focal therapy and particularly of uh, partial gland ablation in the areas of prostate cancer. And these were sort of two seminal works from almost 30 years ago now where Professor Marger was describing, one, what happens when you focally ablate the prostate cancer, and two, is it possible with the modality of high flu, high intensity, focused ultrasound. So my, the objectives of today of my talk are going to be really fourfold. One, review the indications for focal ablation for prostate cancer. Two, understand patient selection for focal therapy, which I think is really paramount. Three, examine complications and follow-up, rec recognizing that it's still early days for many of these patients and four, uh, review focal therapy uh, outcomes to date. Uh, as Sherlock said, well, I'm not gonna spend too much time talking about the guidelines, but recognize that at least as of now, the NCCN guidelines from the United States, and I'll talk in a moment about the EAU guidelines, talk about focal therapy in a very restricted setting. They really talk about prostate cancer after radiation therapy recurrence, and where it's, where, where it's uh, biopsy proven and ideally when you can localize it with some sort of imaging modality. It's in that particular circumstance where it receives a two, category 2B recommendation with either cryotherapy or HIFU, high intensity focus ultrasound. And similarly, the EAU guidelines are really, really no different. Um, but both guidelines really su strongly suggest that if you're going to do focal therapy, you should do it in the context of a clinical trial or do it in the context of a very rigorously controlled uh, prospective cohort. You shouldn't be treating patients willy-nilly with focal therapy just because you can. Um, and I'll show you now, it appears to be that some real-world data show some promise. So who's the ideal patient uh, who should be getting focal therapy? I would say uh, this is perhaps a, a, a matter of some debate. Uh, most folks would say a patient with unifocal disease, a patient with clinically significant disease, that is to say three plus four, uh, in those dimensions, as you see here, a, a core length of six, six centimeters or greater, or maybe a uh, biopsy a volume of more than 0.5 uh, centimeters. It's isolated from vital structures such as the bladder neck, seminal vesicles. Uh, as you can see it, uh, absence of high risk features like introductal uh, carcinoma. And there's still a, really an evolving role now for some genomic biomarkers, say the tissue-based biomarkers like Polaris Oncotype uh, and, and Genome DX. I, I would say though, these things are evolving. And I, my sense is that many of the earliest trials of focal therapy for prostate cancer were done in patients who probably didn't need any therapy at all. And in those patients, not surprisingly, the outcomes were great because those patients really didn't need anything. It, what you need to really understand is the patients who need the therapy, uh, it's that balance between understanding who needs the therapy and who should be ideally treated focally uh, versus who needs maybe perhaps a more radical therapy. So, in my view, the measures of volume and the core length to me are all contrived. It's really a matter of where the biopsy needle went. We know prostate cancers are not spherical, they're not globular, and so it really just depends where the needle hits it, right? So that to me is really doesn't really make much, make much sense. And four plus three versus three plus four, well, I think what's the difference in this context? If you believe your energy can kill the cancer cells, what does it matter if it's three plus four or four plus three? I think right now the trialists are hedging their bets and wanting to slowly encroach, encroach on more aggressive disease, but really want to optimize the appearance of their beneficial outcomes. So um, what are some contraindications? Well, you might imagine a gland that's really too big may not be so good, particularly if you're treating more than just the focus, uh, and we'll talk more about that in a moment, about sort of hemiablation. You want to avoid large calcifications because they can, patients have a lot of uh, flebolus within the prostate because they can, or in the blood vessels themselves, can obscure the visualization of what you're trying to ablate with ultrasound and or other modalities. Patients with inflammatory bowel disease, you might imagine will be um, exacerbated, their disease particularly if it involves a colorectum. Uh, patients who've had prior areas of radiation, again, this is patients, I'm talking about focal therapy up front. Patients have prior radiation therapy, maybe for the, in the colorectal area, or certainly maybe even in the prostate. Uh, and patients with prior brachytherapy seeds, because that certainly can change things. It can change how you see things on the different modalities. But again, also recognize that these contraindications are also in evolution. So uh, my view, and I think this is a view shared by many of us in this room, that focal therapy is really as good as your imaging modality. If you can see the cancer with high fidelity, why can't you spot weld? You know, prostate cancer is the only organ in the body, solid organ in the body, for which we say you have a diagnosis of cancer and we take out the whole organ. If I tell you of a brain tumor, you don't take out your whole brain. 
I tell you I have a liver tumor, you don't take a whole liver. Why is that? Because you can see the cancer with fairly good accuracy, and if you can see it with good accuracy, you can treat focally, whether it be with ablation or resection or you, you name your modality, you can do it. So again, I think the real issue here is in prostate cancer has been our inability to see the lesion with high fidelity. And you can see here, this is the same prostate image with two different MRIs. In the United States, the MRI, I would say, is the most commonest used prostate cancer biomarker. It's certainly something I use like water. But you, you might imagine that depending upon where it's used, the machine that's, being, that's performing it, how it's programmed, and maybe as importantly, who's reading it, the results can come out quite a bit different. And so here you see here, two, this is the same patient done on two different MRI machines, and you get two vastly different images. And if you can't see the, the cancer, you're gonna have a problem ablating it focally. So how do you find the cancer? And, and you see, I think there's a multiple different ways one can do this. You can imagine systematic biopsy plus effusion biopsy if you see a targetable lesion, a pyrets four or five lesion. Some argue that I think probably credibly you should biopsy pyrets three lesions. In our institution, we do not routinely biopsy pyrides three lesions with, with a fusion biopsy. It's pretty much re relegated to pyrides fours and fives. You can imagine patients who, need a, who get a template biopsy it may, may be more robust, be able to really identify those areas of concern, but of course it has significant morbidity. And there's patients who get a 12-core biopsy and who have a negative, uh, who have a negative MR who also might be potential targets for uh, focal therapy. But to me, the better you can visualize it, the better you can isolate it, the more focal you can be with your focal therapy. Because if you're going to hemiablate, in my opinion, and or three quarters ablate, that's pretty close to radical treatment, right? So um, be mindful of how you are selecting your patients. And if you really want to be focal about it, I think imaging really is key. So what are some current challenges? Well, this has been talked about earlier, and you know, multifocality and tumor heterogeneity is a real confounder in the area of prostate cancer. Here you can see a, a whole mouse specimen of a patient who had radical prostatectomy, and you can see here, whoops, sorry, let me go back. You can see, whoops, sorry, you cannot see here. <laughs> Here we go. You can see here several areas of prostate cancer, but we know MRI can't see everything, right? And even from the latest um, study published in the New England Journal of Medicine just two weeks ago, looking at MR fusion biopsy with systematic biopsy and stability to identify high-risk prostate cancer, we know that MRs can miss maybe 15 to 20 percent of what we believe to be clinically significant lesions. Okay, MRI can't see everything. So a patient has multiple lesions. Which one of these is most likely to cause harm? If I knew which one was most likely to cause harm by a molecular biomarker, as you pointed out, or, a, or a, some kind of visual biomarker, then perfect, we can focally treat. But we do not know today which one is the most biologically dominant lesion. And ultimately, that is the question we want to know. Not the biggest one necessarily, not the highest grade in the one necessarily, but what's the one most likely to cause harm? And I think molecular diagnostics are the future, again, imaging. And once we can see what needs to be treated, perhaps things like pharaonostics might even move focal therapy, even you know, push it even farther out, out the door. But again, multifocality and heterogeneity here are real confounders uh, for, for the area of prostate cancer. So what's the idea behind focal therapy, as I mentioned to you? The idea here is to treat the cancer only and leave the rest of the rest of the gland behind. And the purpose of this is really obvious, I think, to all of us who perform radical prostatectomy is to minimize morbidity. Minimize morbidity and negative impact on urinary function, minimize morbidity on sexual function. And so again, if you can see the a, a cancer with high fidelity here, with high accuracy, why not just spot weld? Why not just focally treat that area? Again, if you really knew that this is the area that had the disease that was gonna harm this patient, and there was no other area elsewhere likely to harm this patient. So as I mentioned, there's some obvious advantages and some obvious disadvantages here of, of focal therapy. Obviously, cancer control and versus cancer cure, right? Not all cancers need to be cured, and I think those of us who do cancer for a living recognize that. Um, and aggressive cancers, unfortunately, tend to come back and cause harm, but if we can delay progression, that's still a meaningful, outpoint, a, a, a meaningful outcome for many of our patients. If we can delay and avoid altogether whole gland therapy, great. Again, we get to minimize morbidity or even delay morbidity for a man in his late 50s, mid 60s in terms of urinary function, sexual function. Again, as I just talked about, minimizing morbidity is the real purpose behind focal therapy. Uh, and one of the benefits potentially of focal therapy is if it fails, you can retreat. It's the gift that kept on giving. Uh, and uh, you can certainly receive definitive therapy afterwards, although your morbidity after that will be significantly higher. Disadvantages, well, as I, I mentioned to you, the long-term outcomes are as of yet unknown. 
Most of the studies done to date on focal therapy and localized disease involve men with grade group one or grade group two. Some have grade group three disease, but minimal volume. Many of those patients might not have, might have done fine with nothing. So again, the comparator arms of RCTs really have not really been done in this space. So I'd caution you as we think about good outcomes for some of these patients that in fact, uh, they have the good outcomes are only because they might have done well with nothing. Um, we know that short-term cancer control can be can be good, but certainly they can also be very good with surgery and radiation. In fact, maybe better. And cost and reimbursement. In the United States, doctors get paid to do things. They don't get paid for outcome. And you mentioned about doctors uh, or drug companies uh, get paid to treat people, not, not for curing people or uh, treating disease. Similarly, in, in our system in terms of physicians. So I think we have to be mindful, particularly in a, depending upon the health system that you're practicing in, that you're doing things for the right reason. And that uh, just because you can doesn't mean you should. Just because I can hit a button doesn't mean it'll advance. So I think uh, the batteries may have gone out on this thing. Oh, there. Okay, very good. Let me go back one. Can I go back one? I don't know if I skipped one. Did I skip one? There we go. Just like the Da Vinci, you gotta kick it a few times. Okay, so the principles of treatment here are several, right? There's several different modalities one can use uh, to treat prostate cancer with focal, with focal ablation. You can use cryotherapy, freezing, high-intensity focused ultrasound, focal laser ablation, photodynamic therapy, gold nanoparticles. These gold nanoparticles vibrate at a particular frequency, generate heat, and kill cancer cells. Vapor steam, uh, brachytherapy, uh, uh, thank you. Uh, irreversible electro electroporation, and even radiofrequency ablation. So there are multiple ways you can go about treating the cancer. And I think most of these, thank you, sir. And I think most of these uh, ablative technologies are probably equivalent. But again, to me, it's less about the technology of ablation. It's more about the technology to see the disease that matters. Because ultimately, if you can see it, you can almost do almost anything to it and not to work. Uh, image guidance and robotic-assisted uh, technologies and platforms are currently being developed for this. The template of ablations we're going to talk about here is, um, is under investigation. And margins are critical. I'm sorry, the, this one's not working either. The, the light's not on. It's okay. We shake the batteries. Sometimes that works. Like the home remote control. Sorry. No problem. Mm -hmm. That's okay. These people don't want to eat dinner, don't worry. Or I can just say next slide if you like, that's fine. Yeah, okay, could you have the next slide please? No problem. Oh yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't know, he's the only one over there. <laughs> Let's give this guy a round of applause, thanks man. <laughs> Look at this. Thank you. So as you can see here on the cartoon on the right, there are several different uh, templates one can use for ablation. There's really focal ablation, where again, where you really, what I think is what we should be doing. There's quadrant ablation, is self-explanatory, hemiablation, treating half the prostate, and something called extended dog leg ablation, where you essentially do a hemiablation with a little bit more across the anterior aspect. Uh, but again, with, I think with better imaging modalities, a lot of the more radical focal therapies will be obviated because you'll be able to really perform this technique with precision. Uh, next slide, please. It's okay, uh, next one, the, the forward button. Perfect. So what about the follow-up? I think the follow-up now is still being really developed. Uh, at the moment, it's thought that imaging the, imaging the patient with a prostate MR every six months and at six months and the 24 months makes some sense particularly if you're doing this in a very controlled prospective cohort, again, or in a clinical trial, you want us to be very careful. Checking PSAs, uh, as you can see here, I think are important. PSA velocity, PSA changes are still hard to predict post-focal therapy. Depends on what the PSA was beforehand, depends on the volume of the prostate, depends upon concomitant inflammation that might still be still in, still in place. You might imagine that the PSA velocity and kinetics post-ablation might differ depending upon the technology you use to ablate it. All this is still to be worked out. Biopsying, uh, so some people advocate, and I think it's a very prudent and conservative way is to biopsy patients at some periodic basis, basis to ensure you have free for freedom from recurrence. And of course, it's very important to assess a number of different functional outcomes. Uh, next slide. So here's some 
uh, general complications that have been described for patients after focal therapy. Recognize, again, these are, in general, tend to be smaller series that are cherry-picked. We'll talk here about in a moment, moment about some larger, uh, some larger series. But you can see the, the most common complications are what? Urinary tract infection early on, not so bad. Urinary retention, not, to, not so bad early on. We can manage those. Uh, medium, uh, medium range complications here. Of course, erectile dysfunction in some series can be high. Again, particularly with hemiablation or with a dog leg, you're really extending your um, area of ablation. And late complications such as strictures, uh, uh, r highly uncommon. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, specifically about HIFU, here are some complications uh, with regards to HIFU. Uh, and then you can see here, compared to active surveillance here in, on, on the left side. And then radical prostatectomy, radiotherapy, and, and then whole gland and focal HIFU. And you can see in general, it, it, it tends to look okay. Of course, active surveillance has its own, as, as a man gets older, erectile dysfunction and lower urinary tract symptoms also manifest. But in general, focal HIFU does pretty well when compared to radiotherapy and uh, radical prostatectomy, at least as it, as it relates to uh, these side effects. The real question, though, is cancer control, right? The, the trifecta, the first of the trifecta, which is cancer control. Um, next slide, please. So uh, more recently in European neurology, there have been some large studies uh, published about focal therapy. In this particular study, looking at early mid-term uh, outcomes after primary focal therapy, looking at about 122 patients in five different centers, they found that the failure-free free survival, so that means biopsy failure-free survival at 36 months, was about 91%. Uh, and in this cohort, 71% approximately were NCCN guideline intermediate risk, three plus four, not four plus three. So again, you would, why three patients had metastatic disease in three months? That's scary. I think that's just all about, all about patient selection, probably uh, improper patient selection. And you can see here that overall the morbidity was fairly modest. Next slide, please. Uh, here's a, another report from BJUI. We're looking at over 1,000 patients from two centers here with medium follow-up again of 36 months. 80% uh, 80, 80 of these patients were grade group 2 or higher, which is or grade group 3. They were not higher than that. And you see here, again, I think overall biopsy-free, uh, failure-free survival at, at 60, 60 months approximately, uh, five years was 64%. Treatment-free survival about 60%. And then you have the uh, radical treatment-free survival of 91%. Uh, the other treatment-free survival is another round of focal therapy. Again, all suggesting that, I guess, early days, early and mid-range days, in the right patient with the right modality, with the right disease, you might, I think the outcomes seem to be pretty good. Uh, next slide, please. And here's a, a, uh, yet another study from European Neurology, this time looking at close to 1,400 patients with greater than six-month follow-up. Six-month follow-up for prostate cancer probably can't say much, right? The only thing you can really say is about complications. Nevertheless, in, in these patients, um, overall, they did pretty well. Uh, what was really good about this study, in my view, is that a fair number of these patients were D'Amico intermediate risk or high risk. Uh, and, and I think if you believe you're in, in your modality and if you believe that the disease is isolated at the prostate, even high-risk patients ought to be candidates for focal therapy, right? I mean, a laser or HIFU or freezing is gonna kill a high-risk cell as it will in an intermediate-risk cell. The question is, are you adequately treating it enough? Can you get it to the right spot or not? Next slide, please. And here, you just, uh, next slide, please. And one more. And you can see here that their outcomes are fairly good for intermediate-risk and high-risk again, but these are very, very early days uh, for, for this modality. Next slide, please. So I think there's lots of novel opportunities here. Uh, in, in my view, the most important of which is improved imaging, probably molecularly, molecular diagnostic imaging, whether it be MRI, uh, uh, PET, PET MRI, PSMA PET MRI, or another type of uh, molecular diagnostic. We need better methods for defining and monitoring disease recurrence. My suspicion is that some of the biomarkers that was mentioned earlier that will, will eventually be tested and, and, and uh, credentialed for in the urine. If you had a urine test and you could look for uh, transcripts or RNA transcripts uh, for patients with likely to, that have disease recurrence, that might, might be better than biopsying them and re-imaging them. Uh, we need to have better methods for identifying lesions most likely to cause harm, as I mentioned earlier. And we continue to need to be able to refine and recalibrate our modalities to reduce mor morbidity. And I can't emphasize this more, and I think this has been said a lot today about all of our, our cancer uh, uh, studies, at least, is that we need rigorous testing, uh, we, particularly in the United States where we get paid to do things. Uh, many times we do things, you know, shoot first, ask questions later. I think we need to be more careful about how we uh, allocate treatments uh, for those patients who need it most. Next slide, please. And with that, I'll thank you for your attention. I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Any questions?
For me, one question is why is the hate so big against focal therapy, specifically in the United States? Mm. Um, I would say here in Europe, um, at our center, for example, we have very selectively be using focal therapy based on the factors you said, and I think way too selective. Um, one of the discussions we had with Bertrand Tombal was uh, the question, will it replace, will it be the treatment of choice mm. for those active surveillance candidates that just psychologically cannot handle it, which is over-treatment again, or will it really, what I believe, replace radical prostatectomy and radiation in these, what do you want to call, intermediate risk patients? Yeah. Is, where do you think it's going to go? And well, why I, is it I think in our lifetime, my opinion, is that radical prostatectomy will largely be diminished significantly and it will go away. We'll have better risk stratification for those patients who need to be treated. We'll have better risk calculators for who, people who are likely to die of something else. And focal therapy strategies inclusive of theranostics will play a significant role. I think surgery will be reserved for those patients who have locally advanced disease with significant symptoms, obstruction, hematuria, uh, bladder invasion, you know, the more aggressive kind of cancer surgeries than we're doing right now, typically. Um, that's what I say. It, I, it's, it's my sense is where things are going. I think focal therapy in the United States has really taken, taken it on the chin, as they say, like a boxer for a couple of reasons. One is um, there's an acronym, HIFU. You know, there's the, we used to call it high, uh, high Income for Urologists was another HIFU instead of High Intensity Focused Ultrasound. In, in a system where doctors do a lot because they get paid for, there's a risk for overtreatment for compensation reasons, and I think that's that, that's a, a main reason why um, there's been a, essentially a dim view for some of these focal therapy strategies. The second is, in our health system, is the propensity for, in certain states in the United States, for legal action by a patient against you if their cancer progresses. Okay, so you see a patient, you believe they have low risk prostate cancer, you treat them with focal therapy. Six months later, their PSA rises, you do an MRI, there's another lesion there, and now you biopsy that it's high-risk cancer or they got an enlarged lymph node. You can be sued for that. Now. That is another reason I think that a lot of doctors who, who, are, who, are, who have been really reluctant to really aggressively pursue this because of fear of litigation, and they've been doing it in patients who are on active surveillance, highly unlikely to progress. My risk of legal exposure is small. I might as well treat this guy because he's psychologically bothered and he's going to do just fine. And so we get a lot of patients who get focal therapy, at least in our country, who, who may not need any therapy because it's the safest place for the doctor to treat them. I think this has been the same experience in, in Europe. Um, those centers that offer it, offer it to the wrong patients, so it gets a bad rap once the other people see it, and the other issue is uh, the fear of failing the patient, or fear of getting consequences of that failing, legal or not legal, and by that we failing him around the clock by giving him over-treatment. Mm -hmm. And that's been the issue of under and over-treatment that we've been facing, and as you said, biomarkers, 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 molecular, so on. Do you think lutetium PSMA will be such a strategy or, or not? I don't know. I mean, I know you guys have it here. We have, we're, we're using, I, I, there's a, so at the PSMA lutetium and these, uh, and actinium and what you, you name your radio ligand of choice, I think are here to stay. It's, um, I think it will have a role uh, for sure. I, I think it, the role is still yet to be determined. Combining it with immunotherapies, I think is interesting. Combining it with other therapies, I think is interesting. Uh, in the localized space, again, um, we probably need a better uh, cellular target than PSMA. Uh, but, you know, the, the side effects for the lutetium are not trivial, and you probably have seen them too. The, I mean, both, there's some bone marrow toxicity, there's parotid gland issues, as you know, with PSMA. It's not exactly, uh, you know, a walk in the park. So, but, but I think uh, those sorts of modalities will be advancing um, just as we're better imaging. So w once we can see it, again, I really do think that we'll be able to treat more effectively. Thank you so much. If there's thank no you. further thank question, you. thank you very much, Ganesh. Thank you. Wonderful to be here. Ganesh. Oh, look at this. I've got a sandwich. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much. Ganesh is going to be with us on Monday. He's going to give the, his traditional journal club and uh, new articles to discuss and conceptual approaches to oncology and healthcare in general. So our last speaker is a Michael J. Marburger uh, a, a lecture. This is uh, our visiting professor who for two days we torture, and then at the end of five lectures, we ask him to give us a visionary talk, what is the future of academic urology is the talk, 
and, and uh, I'm very eager to hear because he's given us many vi wisdoms over the last two days that are beyond prostate cancer and so on. These are conceptual philosophical wisdoms, and I want to see where we're going. Thank you. Thank you. So once again, a uh, huge honor to give that lecture. I mean, uh, clearly, uh, Professor Mark Berger has been amongst the true uh, academic leader of uh, Europe at the time I was still a kid, so it's very important. Uh, actually, my, my career has been, uh, I think, influenced by uh, being uh, uh, president of EORC for six years and chairman of the clinical trial division for another year. So for the last 10 years, I had the opportunity to compare urology to other specialty. And uh, to say that, you know, we, we, we have a problem, I guess. And I've tried to list this problem and see uh, what we can do about that. And I can tell you that already meeting your resident, I was very pleased, pleased to so that you're doing a lot of that already. So this would be the starting point. This is when the British surgeon want to establish a college of British surgeon, a very famous internist say, there is no more science in surgery than in butchering. And that's why you know that is one of the reasons why in the UK they still call Dr. Mister and not uh, doctor. So let's come back to the topic academic medicine. So what is academic medicine? This is a definition I came like 15 years ago. This is the capacity of the healthcare system to think, study, research, discover, evaluate, teach, learn, and improve. That's a lot of work. In three pictures, this is this. This is finding a fine balance between research and education. Doing research that doesn't translate into education is a waste of time and educating with our data is what we do as urologists every day. The problem is for us, you adding a third complexity is that we are also real doctor. And many of us spend time in the surgery room. If not, it's to see patients. So that, that, that's really complex. And that's what basically makes us different from the community urologist that basically operate and see patients and do it very, very well. I'm coming from a, Bel a country, Belgium, where we don't have a real private sector, but we have non-academic hospital where the level of care is super good. And myself, when I have a trauma in my shoulder, I go in one of these hospitals and I don't go to my university hospital. The academic uh, urologist, instead of operating, he also has to imagine, test, and validate future techniques and indication, and he has to teach this to the future community urologist. So that's our job. But there are some important challenges who make that job more and more difficult. The first one is that we're not working in an isolated silo. I remember being a resident I didn't know what a radiation oncologist was. I didn't know medical oncology did exist. I had a vague idea that there was a pathologist and a radiologist, but that was not like this. No, we are really working in a world where beside us, there are other specialty, medical oncologists, gynecologists, because urology is not only about cancer, interventional radiologists, general surgeon, and more and more it's getting multi-professional. We've got specialized nurse, psychologist, psychotherapist. And here comes the most important question we should address to the medical com community. This is not why, but it is what. What do we want to be? And I think you addressed that very nicely in your talk. Do we want to be the gatekeeper of urological disease, meaning driving the, discuss uh, the discussion about what should be done, to who, when, not necessarily having to do it, but driving the discussion around the disease, or do we want to be the technician within a multi-professional team? I do remind you that if you take cardio surgeon, this is what they have become. They're waiting in their office that the cardiologist failed to put a stent or failed to do a medical therapy, and they're so happy when they can do uh, bypass to a 95 years lady because that's what they have to do. So for us, the decision has not been taken. To me, the only EAU president who had that discussion was in 2003. It was Pierre Teac, 
who actually organize a meeting close by Paris and say, we have to ask that question. That question was never taken. And we are letting a spontaneous generation take the decision for us. But that is super important, and we're going to come to that because I don't say there is a good choice and there is a bad choice. I say there is a choice to be made because that choice will impact or we will educate the next generation. The second is that medicine is more and more driven by patient expectation and exigency. There is nothing new. That's a work done in 2003 by Angela Coulter, where she was commissioned by the European Parliament to run a survey amongst patients, asking them what do they expect from doctor. What they say is that we want to be involved. We don't want you to do a radical prostatectomy why, and not explain why, how, oh, and what's going to be the consequence. And then there is that beautiful book that was given to me by a UK patient. This is called One in Three, A Sun Journey into Science History of Cancer by a journalist from the time, which is Adam Wishart, who say if you summarize what patient expect, his father had also prostate cancer, if you ex uh, summarize what we expect, it's find a way to avoid that men who don't have prostate cancer get one. Find a cure for those who have one without having to say goodbye to sex life with their pants or with their hair. Develop personalized medicine and improve communication between doctors and patients and listen to patient expectation. And then we had the rise of the patient organization. In prostate cancer, we have a very strong organization that is doing very nice survey. They've collected more than 4,000 questionnaires. They're speaking to themselves. They are now setting the new rule. If the only space we give them is to hand them a lecture at EAU at 7.30 in the morning before a functional urology session, that's, that's not how we're going to solve their solution. And actually, they're doing, and what they say, and that was their take-home message, they say that the first treatment should be active surveillance. And that instead of thinking what treatment we do, we should really put the emphasis of who doesn't need to be treated. Because every other single treatment will provide side effect. And they say healthcare professionals should use these results. And they should also speak to the patient about quality of life and other. And then that was highlighted in your presentation. I think it's worse in the US than it is in Europe. It's the business of medicine. And I call that urology incorporated. Because we are no longer seen by our hospital as scientists, but we are first of all seen by source of revenue. And more and more, uh, we not ask what is our academic performances. We have to fill business case, budget, return, profit margins, salvage cost, and things. So it has become more and more difficult to um, remain academic in a context where the most important thing that is asked to surgeon, it's not to be good, it's to be efficient. And that is totally different. So that is the problem. The problem is that this triple, we, we have like a catch-22 situation where actually we are asked to increase of efficiency, and at the same time, the investment of research is going down, and we are our own source of revenue for research as well. And then there is something which really is particular to urology, to surgery to some extent, but I realize uh, they are randomized trial. I mean, uh, the surgeon, GI surgeon, they do randomized trial, Europe, Japan, comparing uh, hepatic liver resection to uh, radiofrequency ablation, you know, totally fully randomized. They compare uh, different techniques. We don't do that. And we have been seen, actually, in the last 10 years, two things. And I summarize these by what I call the rise of the machine and the puppet of industry syndrome. Rise of the machine, that's easy. These are the two most famous machines today. This is ORS. This is a radiation oncologist. This is a Neymar Linac. And one of the problems between that is that we don't have evidence, but the worst is not that. The worst is that the gap between the best evidence-based practice and what is actually done is getting bigger and bigger. 
There are studies in US and Netherlands that show that 30, 40% of the patient do not receive care commensurate with scientific evidence. And that 20 to 25% of the care that is provided is not needed or could be harmful. So it's not necessarily that we don't have evidence. We have been showing nice evidence on, on uh, focal therapy that I, I say even by EMA would be probably deemed as acceptable. But there is a huge gap between what we know and what we do because we don't want to change. And that is the no-do gap. A typical thing, and actually that's not me who put the, page, the picture, is the patient themselves. I mean, if you look at <coughs> Gleason 6, <coughs> Gleason 3 plus 4 in, the US, in Europe, very large survey, 3,500 patients. Most of the patients, they receive radi radical prostatectomy radiotherapy. So still, active surveillance is not standard of care for low care disease. We did a study in Belgium <coughs> about that in 2013. We tried to understand why it was not incorporated into a standard care. We came with a few explanations. The first one is obvious. Patient is anxious. The patient is anxious. He wants a treatment. Is the appropriate response to do radiotherapy or prostatectomy? No. The appropriate response is to hire psycho-oncologists, try to understand why he's anxious, try to put in place some systematic, you know, about, OK, we're going to help you. Second is the physician choice. And like we said, in system in Belgium where we have a fees-for-service direct billing, the likelihood you're going to have an intervention, whether it's radiotherapy or surgery, is very high. Not because you need it, but because the doctor needs it. And that's totally different. The third one is hospital pressure. It is clear that there is a direct relationship between the investment in the Department of Urology by the hospital and the rate of active surveillance, at least in Belgium. And then a fourth one, which was funny, is that if you are married, you get the highest chance to be treated, and that we haven't spent time. So that is the problem. The problem we have today in urology is primarily generating evidence. Less than 4% of articles in leading surgical journals are randomized trials. And when we have randomized trial, they usually compare a treatment plus a drug versus the treatment without a drug. And what is very important is that we know that even if practice guidelines do exist, surgeons will more often follow what their chairman say than what the guideline says. And that's been a problem over and over again. So if we don't have evidence, what do we do? What do we rely on? We rely on three things. The first one is that we don't make the difference between improvement and innovation. We improve things we've been doing forever, but we never challenge with disruptive, innovative idea. The second is that we don't rely on evidence base. We rely on two concepts. The first one is conventional wisdom. The second is called gizmo idolatry. And I'm going to show you that. And the third one is been said already, we have a huge transactional block. So what about, what about improving, improvement versus innovation? I'm very sorry, Sharok. I put Young, <laughs> and it was too late when I learned that I should put Bill Ross here. So I'm very sorry for the huge mistake. I'm, I promise I'm going to correct that. So Bill Roth invented the prostatectomy. And the prostatectomy we do today with the robot are still the same prostatectomy. This is not innovation. It is technical improvement. We do think a little bit better, but we haven't changed the paradigm. Hormone therapy, when you ask me whether I believe that androgen deprivation therapy was the treatment of choice, I told you no, because we've been doing the same. We have basically have been cutting balls chemically because we don't do it surgically. But we haven't think about the whole concept of targeting the androgen receptor beyond Charles Huggins. And everybody who start to work with me, I give him the seminal lecture of Charles Huggins when he received the Nobel Prize. Trust me, it's very depressing because nothing has changed in them. And that's a problem because we know that a society whose maturing consists simply of acquiring more firmly established way of doing things is headed for the graveyard even if it learns to do these things with greater and greater skill. It is important that we identify and we nurture totally, totally different ID. When you're telling me, uh, 
you ask your resident, are you normal? And if you say yes, you say I'm not interested, that has to be more than a concept. This is the only way we can regrow. And improving existing practice is important, but we need to create new practice. The second one is more, more of a problem because it's more poison because it's even going the guidelines. It's the concept of conventional wisdom. Conventional uh, wisdom has been coined the first time by a guy named, an economist named Galbraith. And actually, this is the idea which are esteemed at any time for their acceptability. But there are differences between what is acceptable and what is true. A good example is that, and I'm involved in that, we have done a lot of trial showing that you can add enzalutamide and apalutamide to ADT. I did two trials, one as a PI, one as a steering committee member, showing that even if you receive docetaxel, you should add an ARPI. But we've never done a trial showing that if you use ADT plus enzalutamide, you should add docetaxel. There's no data on this. This is pure conventional wisdom, fueled by people who are believers, but the truth is we don't have data. Don't, don't ask me. I've been doing all these trials. We don't have these data. Yet, you ask the most famous consensus today, the APCCC, they believe in the conventional wisdom that, yes, we should do it. And even if you go in the Bible of urology, the EAU guidelines, they say the same. So everybody is happy with conventional wisdom. And that's very dangerous. The second one is gizmo idolatry. This one usually people realize very rapidly. A gizmo is a medical device of procedure for which the clinical benefit in a specific clinical context is not clearly established. And gizmo idolatry is the general implicit conviction that a more technological approach is intrinsically better than one that is less technological unless, or perhaps even, there is a strong evidence on the contrary. Let's take the robot. We have a robot. I like the robot. Everybody likes the robot, but let's be honest. There have been 61 studies, not a single randomized controlled trial. And everybody say, okay, it's okay. But radiation oncologists, they don't do that. Once they sit together and they say, wow, we've got this new machine. You know, T3, conventional, MLI, NUC. Why don't we reduce the number of those to help our patient by something which would be not a revolution, it's an innovation, but we want to show that by innovating, we can reduce the visit to the hospital. They don't start gizmo idolatry. What they do, they do phase three randomized trial. And although they believe that the future is hypofractionation, they still impose to patient, and not a little, three, 4,000 patients, they still do randomized control trial. Why don't we do that? Why, why, is it, why, why is it that there is such a difference with people that usually working the next department? And then we do a lot of research. Biomarker, that, that's a huge example. That's a huge example. All these gene classifier, why don't we use them? There are many reasons. There are blocks, regulatory burden, infrastructure, difficulties, but still, when we have something with good level of evidence, we don't use it. So people tell me, yeah, but why is it like that? And I think that that's what I call from business intention to perversion. And actually, it comes from the difference between a drug and a medical device. And I'm going to use an example which is going to be a focal therapy uh, example. You know that from all the technology you can do focal therapy with, there is one, one single that uses a drug. This is 2CAT, palidiporphine. By the time you are injecting palidiporphine in a patient, it moves from being a medical technology to being a drug. And so the company was imposed to go to all the step. EMA registration, evidence-based evidence, randomized controlled trial versus placebo. The other, they don't need to do that. They just have to say the device is certified. And then you create from this. So we went with Tucat, we went, we created, but then they did the registration trial. And we have indeed a randomized trial comparing palidiporphine to, to no treatment with biopsy at 24, 48 months, whatever, but we have a trial. 
And once we have that, at least you can answer, is the treatment active, safe, tolerable, but also the most important, is it better than what we do in real life? So people will say, okay, that's beautiful. We should treat everything we do like a drug. And I can tell you that in Europe, this is the new regulation on medical devices, and this is going to be in place in a few months. And then people say, but then, is the pharma model the holy grail to prove the activity of a new treatment? I can tell you not, because what I show you is the initial step. Preclinical efficacy regulatory market. And then there is something which is similar to market, but you add three letters. This is marketing. And then you have a huge smoke screen, and you create it, what we see a lot with drug, is that although there has been rigid data, there is a large field to allow not independent interpretation of the trial result, and that's been a poison. Good example, maximal androgen blockade, prostate cancer. You knew that very well. 22 trials, all sponsored with industry. What is the goal? Say that two drugs is better than one. Intermittent androgen deprivation therapy. What is the goal? To say that less treatment is better than continuous treatment. Six trials, only two supported by industry. So what we don't do in urology, and that's so important, is instead of marketing, doing optimization. You know, trying to put the treatment we have and trying to see whether these drugs are really treatment. This is no very high of the agenda of the European Commission. Together with the EMA, EORTC established the Medicine, Cancer Medicine Forum. Uh, we have been working with EMA and the European Commission, and they know starting to they know starting to uh, recommend uh, to recommend this kind of approach. The last problem before I go to the uh, before I go to the solution is the young academic crisis. Uh, I don't know how it is in, um, in Austria. I know in France, in Belgium, we don't have any surgeon who want to be academic. Why? Because it's rough, it's tough. You have to look, you have to work. You have huge competition, not only as a surgeon, as a urologist, but also because you have published and, and, and you have a poor salary. So uh, it's really, the, you know, in, in, in football, the more you rise, the more you get paid. If you want to be an academic, you have to get married to somebody rich. You have to be very good in investing in stock market, or you have to be like a capucin father and make poverty and humility, uh, not fidelity. This one you don't need, OK? So and why is it like that? It's very interesting, because we always quote this problem. But it's not true. Actually, there have been very nice survey. This one is a very nice survey done in 2013 by the American Journal of Surgery. And actually, if you ask residents why they don't enter the academic career, beside pregnancy problem in women, which is understandable, this is the lack of good mentor. So if we want to nurture the next generation, we have to work on mentorship skill. That's very important. And I can tell you that you do that beautifully well. So. What do we do now that we have all these problems? I think that there is only one solution. It's going to be education. We have to face the challenge of education of future urologists. But for this, we need first to answer the question we started with. What do you want us to be? Do you want us to be technician? Or do you want us to be gatekeeper? And we need to push patient organization, healthcare provider, EAU, AUA, to take once for all that decision. Because then I can help you. Because if we say, no, we need coordinator of multi-professional urology care. OK. But then teaching surgical skill is not enough. And besides giving a lot of lecture on how oh, to do this or oh, to do that, I do that, you do that, is also train them for what is making a true coordinator, meaning improve professionalism and interpersonal skill, learn to build trust and communicate clearly with the patient, the medical oncologist, and the radiation oncologist, and understand, first of all, the rationale for performing procedure. If you just want to be a technician, you don't need to take the indication. Taking the indication means we need to train young people 
to understand the benefit of these. And you need also to be trained in other aspects. We need to train them on genomics, proteonomics, metabolomic, and we have to do that. If we don't want to do that, then it's easy. Then we just have to kill skilled technician. And if you want to be a skilled technician, meaning to do a surgery quickly, efficiently, properly, then the only thing you need is training. That's one of my favorite authors, it's Malcolm Gladwell, beautiful book. He say, okay, it needs 10,000 hours of work to become truly competent at any particular skill. So if you want to be technician, stop sending them learning, you know, metabolics, genomics. But I don't know, somebody has to take that decision. And then their beautiful work, the robot is a unique opportunity to design a more advanced, introducing AI. In Belgium, we are very lucky. We have, uh, we have got Alex, Alex Motry with uh, his center. He's doing great way. But Alex said, you know, my job is not to make gatekeeper. My job is to make super good skill surgeon. If you want to do that, you can go to Alex. He's got a beautiful center. Second, we need to address the evidence-based urology problem. And we know, and I'm gonna, not going to say the opposite, running randomized controlled trial, let's assume it's not feasible in urology. I, I, will, I could disagree on that. So what do we do? Uh, at least we need to generate proof. Randomization is just a methodology. Getting proof does not necessarily imply randomization. But I think that we need to create evidence-based guidelines and not conventional wisdom-based guidelines. And wherever it is possible, we surgeon, we should conduct trial. If not randomized, we have to do things. And you know, there are a lot of things to be done. There is a, a bad one, it's real world evidence. Real world evidence, this is garbage in, garbage out. Why? Because you take a big bucket of data produced locally. There is no systematic on how the terms are noted. And then from this, you, 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 you try to reconstruct what our people are doing. But understanding that what they are doing is based on no evidence, conventional wisdom, and others. So that's not going to be the solution. Clearly, prospective cohort may help. You have the disadvantage that uh, you, you, you're going to have hidden confounder, but I really believe that for many things we can do, and what you can do is you can have a cohort. That's what we did for uh, uh, stereotaxic radiation therapy of oligometastatic disease at EORTC. We have now a registry with close to 2,000 patients. And then we get a lot of people, most of them being community radiation oncologists. Then they started to put the, the data in the, the system. We have some questions, and then Finally, we say, okay, why not randomize this subset? And then that's where come the concept of what we call Twix, trial within cohort, where in your cohort, sometimes you randomize a few patients to get the answer. And we've got, for instance, oligo -rare at EORTC. So they are a way to do it. And I think that it is us, academic department, we should lead this effort. We have to go see our direction. We have to say, you know, that's what we have to do because we need to do that and we need to be supported by large organizations. So this is our job. And we should stop, compete for scare resource. We should collaborate, build network, and do things together. But the last thing, and the most important, is human capital building. Uh, if you look at most of the university hospital, and I, I can tell you I did, I, I did audit for organization like Movember, Cancer Research UK, 85% of the resource today in urology are actually invested into capacity, technical capacity building. So invested into equipment, material, and less than 20% are invested into human capital. And the human capital is super important. So we need to redistribute our research toward building a strong human capital. And it's funny because you show a slide that you mentioned you did in your car. I don't believe you because you know that for a long time. We need to recognize talent. We need to find excellent clinical surgeons, but also surgeons able to teach their knowledge and skills to others 
while giving increasing level of responsibility to residents with the intellectual curiosity and creativity in research. This is a paper in American Journal of Surgery once again about the seven attributes of the academic surgeon. I'm not going to read all of that, but instead of that, I'm going to talk directly to the young ones. What are the pros and cons of academic surgery? I'm very sorry, they, they, there are a lot of pros. I, I could find a few cons. Uh, I mean, you're going to be an all-rounder in your specialty. Uh, and you're going to get academic surgery, but you're still going to have a long academic research. You're going to be in a bridging position. And to me, it's always been what is the most interesting in being able to bridge academia with non-academia, young with old. You're going to contribute to the society clinically and academy. And uh, you're going to be publicly and socially rewarded for this. The cons, you're going to get no money, no life, work 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And uh, you're going to be competing with others. That's going to be very stiff competition. And uh, it's going to be much more difficult to learn to do robotic, where just before and just after you have to work on your paper. But this is feasible. So I like to say that the future of um, academic urology is exactly like what Einstein pretend, um, predicted, is that what is happening if the bee disappears from the surface of the Earth that men would have no more than four years to live. No more bees, no more pollination, no more plants, no more men. And I think that the young people are the bees, and this is them that we should help. I think that as academic urologists, we should secure cross-fertilization and pollination of young mind. We have to spend time on human capacity building and not on technical capacity building. Uh, or species is in danger, as well as urology as a whole. So uh, we have to do something. It there is time, and I believe that with people like you, we can do it. Thank you very much for your attention. Wonderful. I had my picture already. <laughs> Really a wonderful talk. Uh, the residents and the faculty here in our department know this is almost like uh, uh, we have talked and <laughs> these are things that I'm saying, actually quoting you the same things. Uh, I find it wonderful. And I think every leader that we had today speak feels the same breath, uh, the same uh, uh, heart pounding for the same issues and looking gravely to what this disease that is eroding what the future of medicine can do. Academic medicine is a centerfold of developing the future of medicine and healthcare and way beyond that. Questions that you have? I think there's no, not a the lot of questions. The only question I will answer is, oh, should we go to the party? That is a good question. Before you leave, I have to give you something. Wow. Okay. I have only 50 kilograms in the plane, so. <laughs> so, you've been incredible. You have given us a lot of your time. You are a, really a man who not only through your activities at your department in urology, in the ERTC, and on many levels, have advanced the field of urology. And uh, today you have done uh, a wonderful uh, two days of really hard work with us. This is the plaque. This is uh, the earth with a cystoscope, the weapon of choice of urology. In the center, we put Vienna with the medical university. It says Bertrand Tombal, chairman of the Department of uh, uh, Surgery and full professor of urology, for pioneering contributions to urology and medicine through inspirational mentorship, visionary leadership, and groundbreaking wow. research. Thank you, so Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, you're a very special person. <laughs> it's not gold. So nobody's going to steal it. But uh, thank you so much. Thank you to every one of you who stayed, to all the speakers, to all the listeners, to everyone who got in, was involved uh, and really made this possible. The last two days, but specific today, I know for my residents, it's hard work. It's not going to be remunerated. It's gonna get, not going to get anything else. You're not going to get awards or things for it. But you are in a very special community. People that are crazy enough that they think they can change the world for a better place. That's why we are here. I want to thank one person, uh, very specifically, it's, uh, thank you so much, thank you so much, uh, is uh, Sylvia. Um, we have, I, ha I have a curse. We have a curse, I would say. 
And Harun is always telling me, he says always, you know, two months before this meeting, actually I hire a lot of people to prepare this meeting. Two months before this meeting, everybody disappears. There's going to be only one person you're going to fall back on. It's going to be Sylvia, and she's going to make it possible. So each year, I say it's not possible. I'm going to hire five people to do this meeting. And it happens that two months before, again this year, Sylvia took over everything. And then it was actually two weeks, actually, that was real work. And she made pulled it off all with hard work, staying long, and really taking care of everything. She's an incredible woman. I want to thank you for that. For a minute, minute. I'm very blessed to have the most wonderful team who I'm working with. You're going to see at a party tonight. Uh, I wish everybody would have such a wonderful team and everybody would have a Celia. So <laughs> thank you so much for everybody, for every listener. Thank you for the uh, Medical University of Vienna, for this room, for the photographers, for the filmers, for Christoph with his company that made it possible, for the companies that supported this meeting and made it possible through the uh, um, support. And I hope I see you guys shortly at another place that I cannot tell you in public. Thank you so much.